Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander F., and today on the podcast, we are so excited to talk about Thai occult and esotericism in Thailand, as well as esoteric book publishing with Peter Jenks and Jack Grail. And you might be wondering, listeners, what are these amazingly rich esoteric traditions and conjurations and other esoteric practices in Thailand? Do Thai occult practices have techniques of ritual magic that might be similar to what many listeners are familiar with in the Western grimoires? How about the regional variations of Thai magic and Thai occult practices and also Thai folk magic as well? Well, author Peter Jenks is the best person to ask. He resides in Thailand and his book, Thai Occult, gives readers a deep treatment and also an exploration of magical engagements in Thailand. And his next tome in this series, if you will, Thai Occult 2, Regions of Power, explores this fluid, adaptable system of spirit work that changes with the changing times, letting practitioners tell their own stories in their own words, which is a fascinating topic I'm looking forward to getting into. And also, Peter allows these practitioners to reveal in their own words about the role of initiations, astrology, karma, ghost magic, and so much more. And in Thai Occult 2, this is the first title from Araxes Press, the new imprint that our other guest, our return guest on the podcast, Jack Grail, has launched with Larry Roberts of Miskatonic Books. So I know many listeners are familiar with Jack, who is an author, a ceremonial magician, a practitioner, and so so much else. So thank you both Peter Jenks and Jack Grail for just taking the time and stopping on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be back. The the honor is certainly mine, Peter and Jack. And Peter, I I must say, I, I just have to share this. The first time that I heard about your incredibly deep work in esotericism in Thailand was when I was visiting in person with Jack Grail. Jack, I'm I'm sure you remember this, where (laughs) we were sitting at a table, we were discussing uh, critical treatments of esotericism from around the world. And so, Peter, Jack, he left the table that we were sitting at, and he came back, you know, maybe a minute later with a very impressive looking tome under his arm. And he sat down slowly and he slid the tome towards me. And he asked me in a very <laughs> hushed voice, do you know about Taya Cult by Peter Jang? <laughs> and so it's a lovely introduction. <laughs> yes. So, so Peter, that is how I was introduced and met you in your work. And so I think this is the, the best first question, which if this is how I met you, can you, Peter and Jack, share with the listeners, how did you two meet each other? How did you two start collaborating and, and everything that's happened uh, since then? We, I think we just kind of, we skirted around each other for a while and we were both extremely busy at that time. And I always kind of knew we'd come back and and chat more. Yeah, uh, But at that time, I was in the middle of doing the madness that uh, came from doing the Tire Cult 1, which um, had a, a very profound effect on life, to be honest with you. Because, I'll explain why, because basically when you open... Uh, in my experience, when you open a system, when you open something to the world, that system comes to your aid. That system will continue opening itself to you because you are the conduit. Yeah? And it was a really crazy couple of years when we first did that, which is why I didn't. I never expected to do the Tire Cult 2, to be honest with you. Peter's, Peter's of, showing a, a typical that. British restraint in describing it. I threw myself at him like a teenager at a uh, at a concert. <laughs> and, um, I, uh, <clears throat> I I have I have dozens of of grimoires and uh, and I treated him like Taylor Swift after I had read his. <laughs> of, of all That's the great. dozens of grimoires I have, his is the only one besides the PGM that's actually impacted my spiritual life. And it was when I read it, I understood that it was much more than kind of a a reconstruction of what had been 
or someone attempting to reify an old tradition or someone trying to create a new one. It was a true window into a living tradition that that why I have to apologize on the front end because I have two black dogs here that um, fight constantly around me. So they're punctuating. I, I ask that when they interrupt me, you consider it to be punctuation marks um, <laughs> by she whom they're an avatar of rather than an obnoxious interruption, you know. So, but, but anyway, his books are a window into a living tradition of magic that is a reflection, you know, of, of Thai and Buddhist folk traditions. And as such, the paradigm of spiritual work in it, like actively matches and reflects spirit work that you see around the world. It is culturally specific, but the principles are the same that you see in Kambanda, that you see in Voodoo, that you see in the PGM of Egyptian necromancy. And it's and what it revealed was this fully developed flower of a tradition that can, you know, is fully integrated into these people's community and is essential to it. It isn't just adjacent to it or an appendage of it or a relic of it. It's essential to the culture. And this, I found it breathtaking. And it, to me, it, it really changed my view of what magic could be. And I'm like, who is this guy? How did this, this Brit get access to this incredible world of, of magic and a, and a culture far away? You know, and that, that's what first turned me on to Peter Jenks. Well, P Peter, I, I think, you know, Jack's um, kind of teed this up better than I ever could, but given that, you know, given this incredibly rich tradition, I mean, just going back so long and the regional variations, which we'll get into, can you share to Jack's point with the listeners, how did you become involved? How did you first step into the rushing stream of this esoteric tributary and how did you start your research and and just develop this over the years well to be honest i'd actually always avoided magic you know i grew up throughout my life i've had friends who are magicians and witches and everything else some of which have become very well known after their passing and before um and it was i am i only started into it in about 2016 and I had the first amulet. Everybody always remembers their first talisman. And it was um, what's called a humpayon, which creates a, uh, and it's a really old spell that's incredibly adaptable. And it creates a second body that is attacked by anything that is coming your way that is negative. And it um, immediately cleaned out things, obviously, things that were, have been hanging on to me and my good fortune just went through the roof, which is a very common, which is an occurrence more common than we realise. And I started looking around, I got interested in it, and I got to meet a few of the magicians who were monks, particularly Luang Po and Nat and um, Luang Tanin, um, who was my first real experience of a, a wily old wizard. His image changed when you sat with him. When he moved, he you couldn't follow his movement. It was really odd. And I started investigating it, being curious sort. And I quickly realized that there was no set thought on this matter. There was nothing. It all, and some things were just obviously so wrong that I wasn't even going to entertain it. And with being with having time on my hands, because basically I've been semi-retired for like 20 odd years, um, I started to investigate it. And that led to the first book. The first tire cult book, which is red, it's quite rare. Uh, it fetches silly amounts of money, even though it's the worst work we've done. And it was just about what we thought we knew, which wasn't very much. And it was all, when, when information becomes secondhand, it gets soiled, it gets messed around, and it might be coming from the wrong source anyway. And um, I started, but because we'd done a book, because we produced a book, I could then look at doing a work interviewing the Ajans because I could prove to them that I could do it. Yeah? So... Once we'd done that, a friend of mine, Kun Lee, 
helped me with the initial translations to do the Sat Yam book, the book about the magical tattoos. And But you can tell that the interviews were still guarded. They weren't coming out fully. Yeah, this is a really slow process to get these guys to come out. And um, it was only after producing that book that the, particularly the Ajans of Chiang Mai, um, put their trust in me and I told them I was going to do a book about Sayasat magic. Sayasat is the occult magic. Sai means magic in Thai. And it centered around their work and their experiences because they were all, the ones I was interviewing, were all the top of the tree. They had all learned magic from the best sources. Some of them, uh, one of them had like 30 different masters of both regional and esoteric and local magic. He was also an undertaker. So we had undertaker magic. Um, and we started that process. And that's where Bon, my partner, became involved. Because without bond, we couldn't do this. Everybody needs a bond in their life. Everybody loves bond. He is a very, very calm and beautiful individual who is also extremely smart with the translations and can put up, and he's, he's gentle enough to be able to put up with me. Um, because even the translations are ridiculously difficult. The Tayako one, the big green book that um, Jack showed you, is the story, it's the legends, it's where it comes from. And when you're translating Thai, if you go on Google and try to translate Thai, it just comes out as gibberish because everything relates to something else. So you have to have the, cult the knowledge of the depth of the culture for any translation to make any sense. This is why nobody has done it until this point. And between myself and Bon, we managed to be able to make sense of what was being told us and could tell the story in a particular way. So a Thai person had to lead us into this because it's so deep within the magic. And when we made that book, which nearly killed me, um, because I edited it myself, which I really don't recommend anybody doing. Um, it, it, they knew then that they could trust me and that I was a man of my word. Which is why we were then able to do the Taya Cult 2, which was much more difficult because of having to go to the various regions. And, you know, Peter, this is such a fascinating thing because one of the things that we've talked about in the podcast a lot is in the quote unquote Western tradition of the grimoires and spirit registers, it's a broken tradition, uh, quote unquote. There is no, you know, master to apprentice, master to apprentice. There's been oppression by religious authorities. But can you, before we get into the regional variations, which will be so fascinating to get into, can you give us the broad strokes the holistic strokes on a point that Jack brought up, which is that, you know, when it comes to this tradition, it is unlike being a broken tradition, it's completely saturated the culture of Thailand. Can you share about the specifics and how is it, how is it such an integral part of Thailand? Well, first of all, they all avoid magic because technically in the outward sense, okay, because technically, the Buddha said, do not follow magic. He followed magic as part of his training, and he rejected magic as a distraction. The problem is, is that magic was here way before Buddhism. So Buddhism layered itself over the top, which is why Buddhism spreads. It's why it is accepted into cultures of Asia, because it does not remove what was there. So, like, as an example, we went to Japan recently, and there was a particularly ancient temple in Kyoto, which has a hall of the most incredible 11th and 12th century sculptures of the gods. There's hundreds of them. It is just phenomenal. And it's the same Indian gods. 
but they look totally Japanese. Total, you know, warrior stances, weapons, the classic Japanese uh, dance more face uh, from the dances and things like that. And it's the same thing because it's just layered itself over the top. Yeah? So from that, it influenced, it brought the language, it brought a script, and it brought um, uh, uh, Keta, it brought Yantra as well, it brought the diagrams. Um, and that then influenced both what was already there and started to create its own magic. Yeah? Now, so this is why, um, like, for instance, Ajahn Sir, who is a local, uh, very accomplished magician, he is he searches old what you call grimoire, we call damra. It's a fold-out book, yeah, which are the knowledge of a certain form of magic. He collects it, and every now and again, somebody will bring some along or say, can we have this checked out? Because they have an, an old uh, uh, Damra book. And last time we took it, it was, it was big. This is very unusual. Normally, they're a fold-out book about 10 or 20, 12 inches long, and they fold out, and they're copied by each generation of the magicians. This was a different format. And um, so I went to see Ajahn Sir because he's the expert at the regional forms of magic. And he said, oh, yeah, this is um, from the Burmese court. And I said, do you know the magic? I said, do you want to copy it? He said, no, I know all this. This is, this is Tai Yai. These are tattoos. This is candle magic. I have all this knowledge. He said, but I wanted to see it because we are missing one form of magic. <laughs> that he knows of, there's only one thing that he's looking for, and that is the original witcher for something called Si Peng Payong Kam, which is a balm that, that was made by a ghost. Okay, so um, what they did, this is a very old story, we don't know if it's true, um, Kruba Apirat is from the lineage that created this story. He thinks it's just a legend rather than the truth, but he would because he's a monk, so he's trying to kind of guard himself. And what they did was basically dig up a dead pregnant lady, have a, a man, a good-looking man, holding her hand while mixing the a monk bowl of the mixture used to create the Si Pung Payong Kam. Uh, while Kruba Wat Mai Hong was uh, saying the kata and chanting the magic, the spell, basically. And they knew when it was ready because it would feel like the corpse is stirring the bowl of Si Pung herself. Now, we have lost this magic. But that is about the only one we know of. And that is why this could be of such help. But the only problem is we still don't know the depth of it because this magic serves the community. So they have a very strange way of remembering it. They can't, like in the West, we'd say, oh, do you have magic for this? They would go to the library in their mind and pull out that information. Can't do it here. Can't do it. You have to ask for something, and then they will tell you, yes, I have that magic. You can't ask them, have you got any strange forms of magic? It just doesn't translate. Wow. That's amazing. Jack, I... I think you'll agree with me that, you know, compared, this is a very broad observation, but compared to kind of Western quote unquote esotericism and the grimoires, I mean, this really is saturated in that living, breathing, very case by case specific basis of magician and client or someone coming to them for services. Oh, uh, absolutely. And the thing, if people haven't had the privilege of looking at Peter's books, what they may not know is that what... Peter did, which was so extraordinary, 
was he interviewed with the help of Bon, his partner, he interviewed the Ajarns themselves. So when he talks about asking them questions or the painstaking process of writing them down, his book is not mostly him summarizing Thai magic. His book is him saying to the Ajarns themselves, how does necromancy work? How do you make a magic amulet? How were you initiated? How do you actually send the energy into the item? How do you break a curse? How do you deal with a client and analyze their needs? And then they write down verbatim the response they get from the Ajarn. So when you read their books, this painstaking process of letting the Ajarns, the sorcerers, the magicians speak for themselves, it's like you're sitting next to them gaining this knowledge. It's an incredible privilege because it's not a scholar analyzing a cultural tradition. It's not some academic trying to trying to process it and put it in a form for Western minds to appreciate within a Western paradigm. It's the direct speech of these Ajarns explaining what they do and how they do it and why they do it. And it's and it just an mind-blowing privilege to read these accounts because the magic itself is outrageous. It's visceral. It's steeped in biology and the culture they live in. They use the material of corpses to create spirit and ghost allies to do certain works. They use magical metals. They use, you know, dangerous elements. They'll use all kinds of herbs with special qualities. They use Buddhist prayers and Buddha call upon Buddhist saints. They also conjure spirits of the earth, these Nagas. The Hindu deities may make an appearance. It's a uh, there's all kinds of, they may call upon dead celebrities, pop stars, things like that. It's this, <laughs> it's this web of contemporary and traditional merging into what is at once, you know, a, a magical, spiritual, religious, street tradition. You know, many of these Ajarns were monks in the past, so they have knowledge of, you know, Buddhist spiritual practices. Much of their praxis is influenced by Buddhist traditions, but also local animist traditions too. So it is not a dull page in his books. It's one of the reasons um, Larry Roberts and I wanted to publish his book, because Larry said, Larry Roberts is the owner of Miskatonic Books, and he has over three decades of collecting, producing, selling books. He's enormously successful, and anyone who loves occult collectible books, you know, um, knows Miskatonic books. But he said, I can't keep them on the shelf. They've been sold out forever. When they appear, they disappear the next day. And so we were, you know, hugely pleased when Larry and I, you know, found out that Peter was open to having his next book published by Araxes, because he published, he's published several books. But the first one, The Thai Occult, made such a big splash. And then, um, and this second one, builds upon what he wrote before, not in such a way that you can't understand it if you don't have Thai occult. Everyone would love Thai occult. But Peter takes the point of view, I, and don't let me put words in your mouth, Peter, but you told me, you're like, there's a danger of people thinking Thai magic is monolithic, like it's just one thing. And Thai, Thai magic varies community by community and region by region and village by village. And so one of one of the things he does in this new book is explore the different variations. And what's really cool is you can see differences in the tradition, which is significant, but you also see the underlying similarities, which show that they're all related, you know, show that they're all of a piece. They're all a reflection of this rich cultural tradition, just like food, just like music, just like you know, dance and and things like that. It, it is a, has an artistic side as well as a spiritual side. So there's this tapestry of magic. And and when we say tapestry, I have to say this: one of Peter's most um, understated. You know, he never toots his own horn, but he's a fantastic photographer, and his books are known for being just rimming with images, beautiful beautiful images that he captures due to his unparalleled access to this world. So these photographs of 
golden temples, these photographs of a row of pig's heads with incense rising from them, his photographs of cemetery necromancy of an ajarn surrounded by candles conjuring a ghost with the shroud of a burn victim set forth in front of him. You find this nowhere. It exists nowhere that I know of, but in Peter's books because of the access he was given, and the access was because of his integrity in letting the Ajarns speak for themselves, not manipulating them or exploiting them, but allowing them to share what they wanted to with the West and in a way that they found respectful and always acknowledging who he was talking to and what their background was. And in his personal life, he promotes their magical work and their art in such a way that uh, allows them to find, you know, Western clients or Western clients to find that to find them. So he has an ongoing relationship with them to to celebrate their practice, and uh, and they recognize that, and the books are reflective of that, which is a large part of their power and what makes them different from other books. You know, I I couldn't believe it, Jack, when I first saw the fact that people were just taking bits of information and not saying where it came from, because to get an understanding of anything, we have to know where it comes from. It has to be referenced, yeah? And, then, and it really it was similar to my background where, <clears throat> where I came from, because I come from uh, the Manchester music scene, producing gigs and ended up running a nightclub, which is amazing. It didn't get closed down. And um, I always run things where everybody has to win. Everybody can win at everything. Everybody can benefit from everything. So when the Ajans, um, when we first started doing this, um, and after we produced the large tire cult book, quite a few of them said, where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> and, but it opened the way, and it's, it, it's directly influenced their lives. It's directly changed their lives. And when, you, when I see, take people to, to meet them for work or whatever, you know, people walk in with the a very similar um, attitude and um, cultural uh, response that Thai people, when they walk in to see on the job, they already have that respect. They already have the way of Buddhism to allow the Ajahn the space to be able to work and do his job. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's kind of leveled the playing field around the world, really. Well, and Peter, your observations and, and Jack's observations is, is a perfect uh, time to talk about what was just brought up, your integrity, your access, the fact that you have the respect of these deep practitioners over so many years. You mentioned earlier, Peter, that since this is not a monolith and it, this was a pretty mm -hmm. difficult uh, book or more difficult compared to Taya Call One to put together, you mentioned that you had to prove yourself to get this access. Can you yeah. talk about what does it take for someone with your amazing erudition and direct experience to prove yourself to and prove yourself, if I'm understanding correctly, Peter, not just proving yourself once and it covers the entire country of Thailand, but going region by region, area by area. What is that like to get that access? Well, you never know how it's going to be when you turn up. Luckily, uh, most Ajans know each other. So like when we were seeing Ajan Joe in, um, about Nora magic, um, and we'll come back to Ajan Joe later about something else, I think. Um, you know, he'd already, he knows Ajan Apichai. They met years ago. So Ajan Apichai just gave him a ring and they said, oh, Peter and Bong are coming. You know, they're lovely. Don't worry about anything. And that's it. Yeah, when we were seeing Kruba Apiwal, who is a very high monk, yeah, we, you never get access to people like that to interview them, especially about magic. Yeah? But Kruba Apiwal is of the same lineage of the Sipan Payong camp I was talking about earlier, where the ghost made the barn. Yeah? He's that lineage. He's the lineage holder. And Ajahn Perm Rung, who is in the, the first book and this book, actually, in this book he's talking about Mercury, 
a, a central tie use of mercury. He is now a luxid of Kruber Apira. So he telephoned Kruber and he said, oh, can Peter come and interview? He's going to do a book and wants you in it. So like, yeah, well, of course, what's he like? Oh, it's all right. Oh, of course he can. <laughs> and that's it. And you go. And Kruber had actually set, a, set by a day for us. And, but he was so direct, knowledgeable. He knew exactly. We told him how to project his knowledge at us. We told him what we wanted to know, the style of how we wanted to know it, and what we didn't want to know. Yeah? Because this is about the story of the tire cult. This is about their techniques on a broad basis. We don't want to know the Qatar, even though sometimes they tell us we don't print it. We don't print things that are integral to any form of magic. We tell the story of what they can do and they will lay out the structure of how they do it. Now that is enough for us at this point, yeah? And with Kruber Apiwa, he was such a smart fellow that we'd finished in an hour and a half. And I said, well, to be honest, Kruber, I said, I think we're done. I, think, I said, I think that's all we need at this point because it felt like a natural ending. But we intend to go back to him um, for his Y crew every year and maybe sometimes just to see him to make a donation at his temple. And we, because there's other things we need to interview about that he, that it would have been wrong to do it on one day. You know, I want to interview him about his tie-eye tattoos because no one's ever seen these. No one's ever seen them on the body. And they tattoo the tie-eye deities, which have got a very particular um, image, imagery to it. And there's a photograph in, uh, in the tire cult too, where he's holding out a long black Damra book. Um, and those images are all actually for tattooing. And I want to encourage him to start tattooing at his temple, not necessarily Kruber. Kruber hasn't got the time. <clears throat> he will do special occasion tattooing, where it tends to be just one red dot, using a particular herbal mixture, which is what makes these phenomenally valuable to the person. Um, but he needs next, in my opinion, we will suggest that he trains up one of his uh, younger monks to produce an office tayai satyam, real ones in the temple, which, you know, at the moment, his popularity is going through the roof. And by the time we get this book out, he's going to be difficult to get hold of. But we next need to have a talk about that. And we next need maybe to have Bon have one of those tattoos. So we have the process seen, we have the examples seen, we have the description of them, and it will help the, then help the temple to collect money because that temple helps about five other temples. He is also building temples when he gets enough money. And Kruba Apirat is a very happy man because he is in this position to be able to do all this. Uh, I'll add too on to what Peter's saying. <clears throat> Your question about community, Alex, it's, as you can see, there's a layered communal aspect of this magic. First of all, there's a community among the Ajarns themselves. Like if you call what Peter said, they just call it, they know each other. Many of them know each other. There'll be pictures in his book of a dozen of the top Ajarns shoulder to shoulder at the same blessing ceremony or a magical ceremony. Can you imagine in the West a dozen of the most, you know, respected practitioners shoulder to shoulder, all working together toward a common goal? In the West, everyone's so territorial, everyone's so, you know, oh, his, his, he doesn't know what he's talking about and, and she's just a pain in the neck. I'm the only one who knows. And that, you know, not that they aren't human, and there may be some rivalries, but there is a community among them that's recognized, a community of praxis, a community of specialties, a community of support. So there's community among themselves, and then there's community among them and the people they live among, the villages and cities. And you see that in the fact that in the busiest city, you might pass an 
a street where there's magical amulets for sale, you know, or there's certain, you know, people regularly go to them. They're recognized as practitioners that are that perform an important service for people yeah. that need help and need hope and need some kind of something they can't just get at the through the traditional venue of religion or or contemporary culture. So they're embedded within the people themselves and the people, the respect and the, you know, and the um uh, patronage of the people is part of their community. And third, there's a community with the outside world, which comes particularly through services like what Peter provides. Because for instance, when you read the books about Thai magic, no Westerner is going to read this book to become an Ajarn. Like that's, it cannot, it will not happen. It cannot happen. You have to be Thai. You have to speak Thai. You have to have decades of training in Thai and Buddhist culture. So we don't read the books to become a genres. We read books to appreciate their style of magic, to be inspired by it, to perhaps gain ideas from it or knowledge or respect for the tradition. And if you want to go further as a Westerner, the way we can become part of their community is to either contact them, say for an astrological reading, and uh, and Peter talks about in his book, that's a large part before they do any work in a genre for a client, they'll do an astrological reading because they want to know the entire context of who this person is. What do they need? What forces within them are strong? What's degrading them? What's What they might have too much of? What do they have too little of? So, for instance, Westerners can get um, astrological readings. They can also get uh, amulets, which are one of the main ways that these ajarns provide a means by which the public can mitigate, you know, their fortune or their astrological fate, and uh, and in some ways, perhaps if they're fit for it, engage in Thai necromancy to work with the spirit. It might be the spirit of a tree, a spirit of a stone, a spirit of a place, a spirit of a person. But these ajarns create these remarkable amulets, and Peter has a website called thetaiocult.com where he provides a clearinghouse for the ajarns he works with where their amulets can be bought and sold, as they can in other places. But he's pointed out before, there's a great danger of buying amulets from, from people who hold themselves out as experts, when in really they're just selling cheap junk with no spiritual uh, background. It takes, as he describes in his book, it's an exhaustive process creating these amulets. Not only do they have the full force of prayers and magical workings and intention and energy layered into them, they might have they might have, you know, the dust from seven temples and the sand from seven sand hills and the and the wood of a, a tree killed by a parasite and a, and a special amount of mercury, which is incredibly dangerous to work with. It might have the bones of an actual monk embedded in it. It might have the hair of a celebrity. They, they might have the the shroud, a piece of a shroud of someone who died in an accident, young and violently. There's an incredible artistic, cultural you know, expression. Everyone is different. And each one reflects the Ajarn's personal inspiration and their take on the traditional praxis of amulet making. So there's a greater community at large, which is the world community, which can, if they like, if they're lucky, access this world. But Peter's book helps them understand how to do it because it describes in detail how you can approach this magic. It's not just the same as you buy it and you, you put it on a shelf and you ignore it for five years. Like it's very important to approach the work respectfully and these Azarn's, you know, amulets and the, the praxis respectfully. And his book provides insight from that by giving us the words of the Azarn's themselves. I wish you'd have been here actually, Jack, uh, last weekend. Because yeah. we had uh, the white crew of Ajahn Deng. Mm. Ajahn Deng is, um, he started Satyan 30 years ago and is one of the best known Satyan Ajahns in the area. Yeah. And at that white crew, there was maybe, oh, there was well over 100 local people with his tattoos who had gone for a blessing. And I was, I'm one of them, I'm covered in these tattoos. And there was every single senior major Ajahn in the area because they'd all studied Sakyan with him. Oh, my God. And if anyone doesn't know, Sakyan is the sacred tradition it's of tattooing, the tattoos. magical yeah. tattooing in Thailand. Well, they'll incorporate into the tattoo ink 
sacred herbs, sacred minerals, even grave dust or the or the materia of the deceased in order to create a sacred tattoo uh, take on their traditional design. And the designs are beautiful. And in fact, there's a, a book Peter did, of course, sold out like all his books, um, Sakyan, which is about that magical tattoo praxis. That's incredible, Peter. It was just beautiful to see these important Ajans paying respect to another Ajan that they studied with. In the open, nothing hidden is wow. beautiful. Yeah, And uh, a couple of friends who couldn't make Ajan Dang's Y crew last Sunday are going to come this Sunday with me to Ajan Dang Dings because Ajan Dang will be there and they can get the corpse and blessing with the Lursi mask on the head. The uh, Going to the I'm just going to go a little bit into the pry into inks. There is only one that does that, yeah, and it is using a a piece of skull, but the spirit has been passed on, so it becomes a just a supernatural product. It's no ghost in there, and it is used to get rid of bad people, people with malicious intent. And that's about the only example. Before you used to get people getting tattoos with Nam and Pry in it, which is oil from a corpse, it's a really crazy idea. It'll take you years to get the ghost out of you. Yeah. And so there's kind of all these layers have started to come into what we thought we understood as well. You know, it's it's beautiful to watch, to be honest with you. That is absolutely incredible. And and hearing you share. Peter, your your expertise and your and your truly direct experience, and Jack, hearing your observations, this word keeps coming into my mind, which is visceral. Jack, you you mentioned this too, <laughs> this direct, visceral, participatory, direct a- aspect, and I think this goes when it comes to tattooing, when it comes to making specific elixirs, when it when it comes to specific rituals. I think this is a great time to to really just piggyback on on what you were sharing about the specific techniques, Peter. And to that point, we have a listener question for you uh, from Sarah. And Sarah is asking uh, and saying, uh, Peter, what occult role does something you just touched on and, and Jack Mercury play that you detail in the book? Sarah says, in Western grimoires, I know that there are planetary metals traditionally for each planet, like gold for solar spirits, silver for lunar spirits, etc. But how do metals and herbs work in the Thai esoteric system? Yeah, do you have about a week? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, well, really, um, the metals mm. we're doing in Tire Cult 3. Okay. Yeah, and the same with the herbs. Now, the problem with the herbs is that every Ajahn tends to use, tends to favor a different herb. And I started writing a book about the herbs for four years ago, three years ago. It was the driest, most boring thing I've ever written in my life. And I trashed it. Yeah, it was just, there's no relationship we can have with these things. Most of them are local or regional plants. Um, especially when you start getting into the region of the of this part of the world that is the best at herbal mixtures which is the Burmese and the Thai Yai, Kruba Apiwat and Burma. Yeah? And they are famous for their herbal mixtures, but one of them might include something that only flowers every couple of years on the top of a certain mountain. And you have to approach it without your shadow going onto the flower and, or at night or in the full moon or something like that. Yeah. The original ya, it's called a ya mixture in that part of the world. The original ya mixtures, many of them now cannot be reproduced because they just can't find them. Yeah. So what's happening over time is that now each ajan will t- tend to specialize in what they want to use. So like tomorrow, on Sunday at the Jan Nan Ding's Way crew, I always like the fact that he has a uh, Makua Ba plant next to his spirit house. Makua Ba translates as like crazy love magic. And it's Datura. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
Um, it's Datura, but this is like an orange and white, a purple and white version of it. And that's used all over the world. Yeah. He also uses something called Wan Sabu Wan Sabu Lua means blood. Yeah. Wan is a plant. And if you cut, it's like a big football of a growth with a bit of twig coming out of it. Very slow to grow, but when you cut it, the sap is blood red. And the Jan Nan Ding works a lot with Konkra Pan magic, which is for invincibility, impregnability of the, of the body. And that is one of the main ingredients that he feels an affinity with. So the only way really to look at the plants in particular is to do it from a particular Ajahn. It is just too broad and too esoteric to look at it from any other direction. The same applies to general metals because the usage of metals has to come from one Ajahn's knowledge at a the time. They all do it slightly differently, okay? So let's just look at the mercury. Mercury is, I've had visitors here searching for how the Thais work with mercury. I've had alchemists visiting Thailand wanting to know how they do it. Because I presume it's part of Western magic to use mercury. I don't know. Okay. But the difference is here is that they do not consider uh, process mercury to have any power. You can't just go and buy a bottle of mercury from the shop. Yeah? There are people here who can collect mercury from nature. And the most remarkable thing is, is that they all have a different technique to do it. Yeah, so this has, been, this has been one of the revelations of this book. Let's look at Kruba Apiwat. I have, we have the knowledge of Kruba Apiwat. I now have the knowledge of how Ajahn Apichai collects his mercury. And we have the knowledge of Ajahn, Ajahn called Ajahn Samad, how he collects mercury in the wild um, from a Burmese prime magician. It comes from a lineage, a really strange, strange lineage. Kruba Apiwat collects his mercury using a pot using sacred metals, so it's like metals from a melted Buddha and things like that, and using rotten meat and burying it in a certain place. The mercury in that area will come to eat the rotten meat. And he enchants this pot using Qatar, so they have a way of enchanting mercury to bring mercury forward. Yeah? Now, he describes this process fully, and he said he gets that much mercury, and I've just got my thumb against the top of my little finger to show the tiniest amount, not even a cc, and that can take six months. Yeah? And then he processes it. He processes it by continually boiling it with a particular herb, herbal mixture, which in itself will remove the poisons from the natural mercury. The blessing process for that form of mercury to make it into what we call a parlot, one minute, ah, parlot on my finger. It looks like brass, and it's cast and polished. Yeah? This has gone through almost a year of blessing where monks will get together and do 528 repetitions of a particular qatar, and the qatar changes each time they do the blessing. Then it is cast into these shapes. And this is the truest parot I've ever found because this sort of thing cleans the body. You can feel it going through your body, slowly but surely. And it kind of both protects and raises our us. It raises the spirit within 
it has the most peculiar effect. And I've just put it on, so I'm going a bit lightheaded. And we feed it by giving it uh, a sheet of gold. Okay? So that's one way of producing mercury. A Dan Samart's way of producing mercury, again, involves brackish water, but he uses the blood from his gums in a basket to attract the mercury to the basket, which is way more complicated than it sounds just from that brief explanation. And I've seen a bottle, I've put two photographs of it in um, the Tire Cult 2, because we never, ever see it. You never see natural mercury. And because it is, it looks kind of, it's very difficult to photo. It messes with your camera. I can't get a good image of it. It's as good as I could get. And it has a very different energy to it. And in this case, he uses it with um, prime materials. He uses it with human materials. Generally, we don't know how he does that either. Generally, um, a mercury amalgam gets rid of ghosts. It keeps ghosts at bay, which is why we have mercury amalgams in magical knives. It kind of knocked back all evil, dark or negative forces, but not in every circumstance. Now the Witcher is opening up where it doesn't do that. <laughs> so every time we go down a corridor of some knowledge, something else comes up and say, well, actually, it's also this. Absolutely unbelievable. I am just, I am blown away. And and just, just again, that, that direct participatory aspect, tethered to the land, tethered to the local herbology, the local topography, spending months just for, as you said, less than a cc of mercury. That is, yeah, that that's incredible, Peter. I mean, that's the best part of that interview, though, I have to say, the best part of the interview, and he knew exactly what he was doing, Kruber. He just said at the end, "Well, of course, it's very nice also to use human meat." <laughs> and, but let's not let's not lose sight. You know, it's an aspect of their own blood or the blood of animals they live off of. I mean, it, it. Peter has a beautiful phrase he uses sometimes in his book to say, "They are the body of magic." It's not like these ajarns do magic. It's more like they are magic, which is why he said it's so hard for them to get them to explain it because it's inherent. It's like asking a fish to explain water. A fish wouldn't know what you were talking about, even though its whole existence is predicated on water and water is constantly passing through it. So these Ajarns are a living embodiment of the magic of the Thai people. And so, and that's expressed by the amount of how developed it is. It's expressed through their body, their sweat, their spit, the melting down their icons, the work they put in, the prayers they say, the brotherhood they share, the way that they, you know, give up, devote their whole lives to what is often could be a dangerous or a, you know, a, a demanding praxis. Their, their mm. whole lives are an expression of the magical aspect of the Thai people. And they're the, the flower of that vine. So, you know, it's, and that's why each, each one is slightly different than the other. But if you look at a few, you sense the commonality and the commonality expresses the beauty of the whole. And this is where really I should give a shout out to Ajahn Sir, actually, because he did the most difficult job in this book. Ajahn Sir is in Tyrakult 1, he explains, he comes from a very old lineage. He has very ancient magic. It's incredibly strange. It works as well. And we asked him, and I chose him because he's a very smart man, and we had to coach him how to do this. I asked him about Lana magic from a completely different direction. So I was forcing him to think about himself, what is in him, from a totally different direction. And I had to give him a week to consider each interview, uh, interview section because he never, ever looked at it in that way. And he did it. He did a brilliant job and he showed what a truly remarkable man he is. 
Mm. That is, that and, is oh, incredible. one more. Yes, please. Going to um, they are become magic. I just wanted to show you this. Uh, I'll take it off. This, for some reason, over the past year, the body products from important monks have been coming to me. And because monks become magic itself, they produce something called patad on death, which is, um, I'm not, is it Sarira maybe in other cultures? I'm not sure, but crystals can form on their remains. And the remains can also have like small pebbles or gems or things like that. And I've seen like the hair of Long Poppy now has got now got crystals on it 20 years after his death. Mm -hmm. uh, you, there are museums you can go to. There are places you can go to in Chiang Mai to look at actual patad from the most remarkable and famous old monks. This is a different kettle of fish. This is a carved tooth from a very famous Kruba who was taught by Kruba Sirichai, who is the monk of this region. Uh, it's from Kruba Wong. And there is a tradition of carving their teeth, especially the incisor. Um, and they kind of embody what magic they were good at. They embody what um, magic they studied the most. And Kruba Wong was phenomenally psychic. So even though I've got teeth from other famous monks, um, I like this one because it just has a bit of a bit more meat to it. Mostly they feel like uh, angelic. Mostly the monks are actually become angels anyway. Um, <clears throat> but this is from a different place. And like in the book also, we have an introduction from uh, Ajahn Subin, who was a Kruba for 20 years before he came an Ajahn. And he's an angel. He's a living embodiment of an angelic. He is always the same. He's just, he just shines and everybody sees him as the angel he is. And again, we were extremely lucky to have him introduce this book and talk about karma and reincarnation. You know, we've, we've gone the, the, the whole distance with this one. You know, I, I know that the listeners will appreciate this as much as I do, ju just hearing you share about this. And, and I would love your thoughts on this, Peter, because as you're sharing about this, this, this just came to mind. In the Western tradition, quote unquote, broadly speaking, I think there's this effort constantly, and, and Jack's uh, intimated this as well, to systematize things, to make things into a neat, tight little system, having you know the perfect correspondence tables, everything else. But would it be fair to say that in Thai occult, in, in, in Thai esotericism, because the practitioners are so idiosyncratic because there's so many regional variations, because you may have a special, a, a someone who is so specialized in this area of the country, but on the other side of the country, there's a, someone who specializes in another very specific, unique thing that it, would it be fair to say that not that systematizing things is impossible with Thai esotericism, but just that the heart of it, the living beating heart, is in the regionality, is in the idiosyncrasies of the practitioners. Would that be somewhat fair to say? I think it will be fair to say, and also we will never get to the bottom of this, ever. It is never ending. It never stops. And as soon as the world changes, it will change as well. Like, you know, you have experts in the collection of Mercury, and that's all they do. You have a Jans who can do things that nobody else can do. And we're just getting the skin. We're just, you know, we're getting the same as Kruber Apiwak gets with collecting Mercury, the 1cc. We have a chance of understanding the story and hopefully learning from it. Because if I believe magic can save the world and will save the world and will save us as a species, but we have to come together to be able to do that. We have to do that. We have to 
appreciate what we can all do in the same way that they appreciate what everybody, the different things everyone can do here. Mm. We have to open ourselves to it put a, and put open a, ourselves to change. It's so, if you notice too, what Peter's saying too is a lot of times in the West, there's binary thinking. You know, we're famous for it. And it, it's binary thinking is good if you're constructing a high rise. Binary thinking is terrible if you're developing a spiritual or a moral or, you know, justice system. And a lot of times we're obsessed in the West between the right way and the wrong way. It's, it's A or it's B. It's light or it's dark. It's good or it's bad. It's right or it's wrong. It works or it doesn't. And that's one of the reasons as a Western esotericist, it's so hard to be supportive of other people or join and join things because you all right away, you encounter difference of, well, I don't call quarters that way. Well, I don't believe in energy. Well, I don't, that's not my deity, so that's not right. Well, that's not, I don't belong to that tradition. Well, this isn't an ancient tradition, but that one's too new. But this one, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's right or it's wrong. It's good or it's bad. But what that means is the only right one is your own. <laughs> and, and of course, that says a lot, right? <clears throat> Part of what you get when you hear Peter describe it, and when you read the book, you see that every single one of these ajarns Slightly different styles, all these regions, different focus, all these different cultural expressions, each one with its strengths, each one variations on a theme, each one, you know, sometimes they're not quite the same. One might say light 15 candles in this circumstance. Another one might say, no, light 20, 21 in this circumstance. Somehow these ajarns don't just say, well, that's a bunch of nonsense. Who would work? That can't be working. It's 21 candles. Whoever heard of that, right? Instead, the sense you get is they understand there's a continuum of praxis. It's not binary. And so each one of them is expressing the magic through their own mentorship with their ajar. And if there's differences, they come from their direct experiences of spirit work, them talking to their gods, them talking to their ghosts, them talking to their best selves and their guardian angels to come up with a variant on what they were given by their mentor and what that mentor did from his mentor. But what it means is you also, in general, respect the, the strains and traditions done by your fellow practitioners. You might even ask them for help or, hey, come collaborate with me or do that thing you do so well and I'll do mine and together we'll make this. And it becomes this open-mindedness that maybe they're both right, even though they're not the same. And that's the best of Eastern thinking, right? That's the door to it, which is so hard for many Westerners. And it's and, and what you get in the book is seeing this beautiful array of variations. And it gives you, it's very humbling because it gives you a sense of the variety of this tradition, which developed in different ways over time. And yet there is a constant, the paradigm is similar. It's about devotion, it's about alliances with spirits, gods, ghosts, earth, plants. It's about you get what you you get what you give. It's about being humble in the face of these powers of the unseen and that the study you put in and the devotion and above all the respect you give your mentor and to the process is reflected in the respect that you know your your care for your clients or for your own practices or your own ghosts, you know, or your own the, your guardians and your spiritual mentors, there's this web of interconnectivity that you look at it and you know, like Peter said, you're only seeing a glimpse of it as a Westerner. And now it's been translated sort of twice before you get it. But it's so humbling and it's so inspiring. And even for someone who never buys an amulet, I think it's enough to make them sort of reappraise their own praxis, perhaps, or their own relationship to the unseen world and think, how might I be more like them. And I think to do so would be a great boon to anyone because this praxis they do is it's truly profound and effective. And even if we just adopted some of the principles alone of non-binary thinking, of collaboration, of respect, of honoring those that came before us, of trying to put in more into it than we take out, I think we would all be the better for it. Uh, yeah, that's very well put. I am... Um... I think there's, there's a couple of things there as well that uh, could be added whereby a jans here will often say, if a job turns up or a client is there, like a jans will often say, oh, go to see a jan per rung for that. He's better than I am. Mm. He's a specialist in that magic. 
Mm. And I think really what would be a very helpful thing would be remember we all learn the skills that other people can do. We all look at those skills. And in that way, that could be the start of building a new foundation of magic. I know the West is based on um, the personality, on that particular individual. And I know it's usually seen as because of our egos. But e the ego is essential in everything. Otherwise, we cannot use our intelligence. We won't even feed ourselves if we haven't got an ego. Yeah? But that ego, Ajahn Apichai put it very well recently. He said, your ego should be put into producing the best magic you can produce and so you can be of service to the people around you. And I think that would be a very, very good start for anything of that kind. We have to come together. We have to come together to get through the future. This, this kind of holistic approach that you're encouraging, Peter, and to your point and to Jack's, this, this kind of uh, invitation to have this renaissance, if you will, this, this very powerful coming together, I think leads to something that you've touched on already, but you, you did share with me recently, and you've touched on it just in this conversation, conversation mm -hmm. that the amazing thing is that, as you say, once we open the door to forms of esoteric knowledge, other aspects arise that you say, keep the door open. Now, you've, you've touched on this uh, before, but can you go more into that? Can you share a little bit, maybe an example about opening that door that, that listeners would resonate with and, and really understand? Um, Ajahn Joe, we mentioned earlier uh, with Nora Magic. Nora Magic is basically an ancestral cultural thing. Yeah, or so we thought. Later, recently, a, a lady came to see us who's been under the effects of a curse for over 20 years. Now, that is a terrible burden. And she couldn't visit. We first talked in 2020 and she couldn't visit until recently. So, and she ended up, she was living in Southern Thailand and she married a man that she didn't even really like. <laughs> Which I think is great, actually. I'd love that magic. Um, she married a man that she, she didn't like, and she said everything always felt weird, and she felt like she had been cursed because nothing had gone right in her life from that point. But everything kind of also worked in his favour. He came to live in Germany. He managed to get a work permit in a way that was absolutely impossible and things like that. It was very, very strange. And she finally, I just said, well, we need to go to see Ajahn Sir because Ajahn Sir will know what to do or know somebody who will know what to do. And we went to see Ajahn and he has a thing in the morning. We have to go and see him in the morning because he's incredibly psychic in the morning. It wears off as he starts eating. Um, and he held her hand and then he started asking her lots of questions. And he said, I've had this two years ago. He said, I think it's a curse from the Nora. Now, I didn't even know they did curses. And he said, this curse comes from the tears of a seed cow that they have to corral and stop it going back into the water so it gets too hot. So it basically torture it and it tears yeah. And they collect that and it is used as a binding curse on unsuspecting people. And I'm sat there thinking, wow, this is great. You know, but it must have been nightmarish for the lady. And um, she came back and we said to her, John, can we do anything? He said, yeah, come back tomorrow and I'll work out what to do in this particular occasion. We're going to do a Satuang ritual, which is very ancient magic to clean people coming back from war, people coming from terrible, something terrible to clean it off. Yeah? It's like um, renewing the cash of a computer. And um, he wanted her to release fish, to build her karma back up, build her... Um, 
personal uh, guardian backup and to undertake quite a bit of candle magic to restore the natural magical attributes that we all carry, good fortune and things like that. When we went back to do the Satuang, it was a Satuang I've never seen before. I've photographed the Satuang ritual many, many times. This one had a... I've only seen this once before, and it was when Ajahn tried to reconstruct the spirit within somebody who'd been poisoned continuously for years with Naman Pry, and he'd lost himself. And he built a body out of rice, blessed rice, and on this occasion... He had thorns from a particular tree and she had to leave her hair uh, on the first visit because he wrapped the hair through the thorns and it was spiked up to stop the curse coming back at her. Yeah? And we went through all this process. I did it all for free on this circumstance because she'd been suffering for so long. And her mum was with her and we talked to her mum about what she has to do to stop the curse coming back in her daughter. If she starts talking about it, tell her to shut the fuck up. Things like that. Yeah, Don't let it back in. Don't allow it to come into thought. And we talked yesterday and it's going very well indeed. And they're going to come back in about six months for another check from Ajahn to make sure it hasn't come back. So, <laughs> when we, I have to physically take a book to see a Dan Joe. And when we go to see a Dan Joe, we're going to talk about Nora curses because now he knows we know that there are them and he will tell the story. And that's how it works. That's how things just will continually come up. Wow. It was a hell of a incredible. <laughs> you know, this and this experience, kind of the experience we all gain from seeing these sorts of things makes it even more useful because we have an idea of what it can actually do. If things get too serious with a curse and they're possessed, we go and see Ajahn Nanding because goes because he's terrifying. You're a can be, he's a lovely man, thank God. Um, you know, it just enables us to know the depth of some of this and what can be done. And really, the work is not going to stop. I have to document next the stuff about the curses. And we might end up doing an appendix by email for people who buy this book to put that in. I don't know how. I've just come up with this idea, Jack. I don't know how that would work. <laughs> um, you know, we'll just send we'll talk a about PDF. It. We'll talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, because, you know, it doesn't stop. And other, there's, there's more. There's something we mentioned it very slightly in the book because I'm not going there yet. There's a form of Muslim, Southern Thai magic deep in with the, within the Muslim community. That is terrible, uh, but they they do a lot of curse work and they do a lot of graveyard work, and they even have satyam. Now that is taboo, which is why it's not in the book. It's why I'm not putting it in there. It's why I'm not even going to interview about it. But at some point, we do have to know to be able to get a fuller picture of these things, you know. But I'm not going to start upsetting my Islamic brothers and sisters. That's just incredible. And Jack, you know, when, when, when you hear Peter share this inexhaustible, well, you know, as, as Peter says, all of this research, all of these traditions, it's just the, the tip of the iceberg. It's just the skin. It's just the surface. Do you think that, you know, as, as someone who's familiar with, you know, Hecate and the Greco Egyptian magical papyri, you know, something you've touched on is there's this misconception people have that, well, I need this specific spell for this thing. And once I do it, I'm done. There's no more relationship. There's no more, you know, work with the spirits. And what Peter is saying, you know, using that that um, woman that he helped and, and just this, this breaking this curse, that there's this ongoing relationship. And there are these ongoing provisions that you have to have in mind that perhaps is, is lost or truncated in quote unquote, Western traditions. Yeah, it's, it's a good, it's a good point. There's um, 
there's a sense that we're amphibious creatures, right? Of both flesh and spirit. And in these Ajarns, you see, because of their daily practice of magic, they're able to immerse themselves in the spirit world. It's natural to them. It doesn't feel like this strange, super mundane thing. It feels like an extension of the natural world, and they exist in both at the same time. Most of us can only imagine what that would be like. But if we want to get closer to it, we can take a note from them and whatever our own spiritual magical practices to begin trying to do it more than we do it, which is easier said than done when you've got kids and a job and obligations and such. But you do see it. And I see it sometimes when we'll talk about a certain spell, say in one of my courses, like a a, a spell from the, the PGM, the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri. It might be one paragraph long, you know, and someone will say, uh, you know, well, I did it, not much happened. And I said, well, you know, there's an addendum to that spell that says, if you do it seven times and nothing happens, then try this, which imply, well, I love notes like that, because it in it, you can see the sorcerer does it once, doesn't feel anything, does second time, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. After the seventh, the addendum is usually kind of an angry demand of what am I, you know, what am I, chopped liver? Who, who, who are, you know, who are you to ignore me? Like, like I, I'm initiated. Like, well, what's the problem, you know? But it's a conversation with the divine. It's a conversation. And like most conversations, it doesn't begin and end with one word. So what I often hear is, you know, I, uh, you know, to do a spell once, even when they think like that felt very effective. You know, I, I made this offering. I said these words. I felt really good. You know, there was a, the wind gusted up. I heard the bark of a dog. I had a, the shivers rose on the back of my neck. I love that spell. It went well. And often the only advice I said is wonderful, you know, try to do it again, you know, next week. Do, do it a third time. When you do it, how many times do you read it? Well, I just read it once. Read it five times. It's a paragraph long. Why not? It's and, and of course, as we begin to say it again and again, you own the language. It becomes internalized. Literally, the synapses in your mind start to form to where the words become an extension of you. The working, you become more confident. Your, your breath falls easier. Your voice is more firm. You begin to see the words in your mind. They become your words and not the words on a page. Eventually, you're not reading them anymore. Eventually, you can just say them aloud when you walk into the night. Eventually, that spell lives in you. And whether the spirit you called came or not, the spell comes to reside within you. It becomes a part of you. It accretes to you like a barnacle on a turtle, and it becomes part of who you are, which is why to do these workings and to do them repeatedly, not in, you know, we don't all have the, the luxury of spending six months, you know, in a room, you know, while someone else feeds us, you know, while in a state of absolute purity, but to begin working toward, it's an incremental thing. How could I do more than I'm doing? Even if it's repeating the spell twice or doing the same spell once a week for a month, we begin to immerse ourselves in that world. And as we do, we begin to be part of it and it part of us. And it brings forth those qualities in us that are of it. And that world, and most practitioners can confirm this, that world begins to make itself available to us in ways it otherwise wouldn't. And every practitioner knows once they start putting themselves on the line, the synchronicities appear, the epiphanies start to happen. You start to see effects in your life you didn't notice before. And you think, did that happen before? Or am I just noticing it now for the first time? The question's meaningless. The point is, you feel the unseen pressing upon the membrane of your mundane existence. And it's because you get what you give and you get out of it what you give. And you always, I think, get more than you give, but you have to reach out, however clumsily, however, you know, um, even if you don't feel you have the right tools or you have the right background or you have the, that you wish you had a mentor or you're not fully initiated or your, your praxis is piecemeal or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Because if the one thing we tend to see is spirits, you know, like animals and like people, respect someone who makes an effort respectfully and diligently and does the best they can to connect. And for whatever reason, some spirits want to connect back. So I think I think that it's a great reminder. We can't always immerse ourselves to the extent these Ajans do, but most of us could do more than we do. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I get questions sometimes about, I always encourage people to do 108 Qatar, um, repeating a certain Qatar 108 times, using the monk beads. It's normally a short Qatar because otherwise... You know, you can be there all day and we haven't got time. 
And, you know, it's like the simple. So what's the simplest one you can give? I said, Puto, which is the Buddha. Yeah? He said, oh, that sounds easy. I said, we'll go and do it 108 times. And then the next day I got an email back saying, I can't breathe. <laughs> I don't know where to breathe. Yeah. And they said, well, send me a recording in a month. Otherwise, I thought God is going to write to me every single day, you know. Um, got a recording in a month. And I said, okay, that's a very good start. But it's put to, not put to. Ah, okay, go away for a month, come back and try that 108 times a day and send me a recording. In a month, I got back, I didn't get a recording. I got back a message saying, this Qatar is changing my life. My brain's clear. I can see colors. I can see, mm -hmm. you know, things are coming to my life I didn't realize were there. I said, yeah, okay, carry on. You're becoming, we can become magic itself. We can make ourselves aware of that that is the case, that is available to us. And that's just from two words. And we should never, ever forget to say thank you. Mm. What, one of the, my favorite things that Peter says in the Thai occult is, you know, much of the magical practice has magical words and phrases in it. And as he just said, the kata is a magical phrase that could be short or longer. It might be recited you know, eight times, or it might be said 108 times, but, and many amulets and forms of magic come with their own kata. And if you're lucky enough to own an Ajarn amulet, he'll give you the kata so that you can honor it and participate in the way that it's meant to be participated in. And these katas, you know, there's often a string of syllables and a Westerner would look at it. And Peter said, a lot of times people say, well, I want to know what I'm saying. What does it mean? And in his book, Peter said, don't worry about what it means. Some can be translated, some can't. Some, the language degenerated from what it was a thousand years ago. Some are just, they've always been meaningless. Some can be. Don't worry about it. Because the more it's an intellectual, you're trying to figure out what you're saying, the less it is a visceral process. It's not meant to be an intellectual puzzle that you figure out. It's meant to be a visceral, sensual participation your whatever the kata calls the spirit, feeds the spirit, declares the spirit, none of those require you understanding why it does that. It's beyond comprehension. And so I love that because a lot of times people stall out looking at an ancient spell from the magical papiri or, or, or a, even a you know some Enochian tradition and say, well, what's it mean? What am I saying? And the message there is the same. It's like, don't worry about what you're saying. It's not instructions from IKEA on how to make a shelf. This is a magical spell, and these magical words are the key to triggering the spirit participation, you know. So, which is great, because most of us don't speak Egyptian, or Westerners don't speak Thai, and we can't even figure out the Enochian, what, what, what the heck it was. It doesn't matter. And there's a great relief in it not mattering, because what matters is praxis, not knowing everything. We are actually, I think, the least important thing within it. We're just a channel. It just, <laughs> it, it just is. We're just tuning into a radio. Yeah. And, you know, like the same guy wrote back again recently, Mr. Pupto, I nicknamed it. He said, what do I do now? I said, well, how does the word feel forming on your lips? How does the lips move? What does the breath feel like going over the lips? Is the nose involved in this? What about your eyes? And then he replied, he just went, oh, shit. <laughs> so I might not hear things again for about six months now. You know, I've just given him a pile of things. And when he, I think in a few months, when he sends a recording back, I can go, yes. Mm. Yes, How that's a very good beginning. That is incredible. What, what, a, what a powerful reminder that... Even though, as, as you said, Peter, too, you know, the, we, we couldn't feed ourselves if we didn't have an ego. And, and it's, about, it's about using that, transmuting that in the service of others. But at the same time, we're a channel. We are a reservoir as constantly, a tributary is constantly moving through us. And it's about adapting and modulating and being malleable enough to allow it to pass through as opposed to, to forcing something through. I, I think that is such a power. Would that be fair to say or? 
Yeah, I think it's fair, but I'll tell you my experience on one time. Um, because, you know, I'm a rigid old English bugger. And um, we had, uh, I was I had a maypur. Maypur is a very ancient um, fertility goddess, basically. She's always represented with her legs open. You know, she's for good fortune, sex magic of old. And uh, I've always loved maypur. And I had this really phenomenal amulet from a jam we were to and uh, actually Jack showed his photograph earlier um, and it was it took me four days or five days to be able to wear it because I couldn't breathe when I put it on it was that heavy on the chest so I kept trying to connect to this I was saying the Qatar all day whenever I walked and everything and I was getting really frustrated and then one day I had this scream in my ears and I nearly fell over and she was so annoyed at not being able to get through. It was like getting a slap from the heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was like, oh, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so everybody does it. Everybody goes through it. It's nothing unusual. It's just part of it, you know. And from that, we learn. It just is. Well, this, I think, follows on something, Peter, that, that you've touched on as well, which is that this incredibly, you know, regionally diverse, incredibly rich tradition will never be fully discovered. It's, it's simply an inexhaustible well. And to that point, you've, you've touched earlier about uh, on the relationship between, you know, Thai esotericism and Buddhism. But could you also share with us a little bit about the relationship between uh, Thai esotericism and Taoism and this thing called jade water, for example. Can you just share a little bit about Taoism as well? I know nothing about Taoism, to be honest with you, but Taoist people who study Taoism, I've got about half a dozen people who we, I often talk to. And they're, they're, they're great. It's the same. It's all the same. Yeah, it's just a different way, different passage, different culture that this very similar knowledge is filtered through. And a friend of mine recently wrote to me and said, um, um, discussing something about jade water. And he said, he said it, it comes from a certain state of meditation, a certain very high level of meditation, uh, where the saliva itself becomes magic. Much in the same way that teeth can become magic, yeah. Um, and you see, there's many videos of monks chewing a mix of betel and herbs. Betel nut makes the saliva very red, and they'll often spit it out into a handkerchief and give it to somebody. That is because they are producing jade water, what is known as jade water. There is no, I've not been able to find out a correct term for it here. It's just one of the relics of a monk. Yeah? But that um, is where it comes from. And of course, I have an old bit of, it's called Mark here. Um, but there's no specific name for the saliva itself. Yeah? And I, 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 have, I, I had one in the cupboard and nobody really understood it. I didn't understand <clears throat> why it was so important. But now I understand about Jade Walter. And this is where um, people talking to each other and listening can open so many doors. It's like the Ajans need people to ask them questions before they can pull out a form of magic that will, that will work. Nobody can hold everything. Nobody can hold all the forms of magic. There has to be a communication throughout the world so we understand what the world has and what remarkable people can produce in magic. Yeah? And there are some amazing magicians out there. It, but it we has, just need to share. Yeah, that has, you recognize that too, you know, Alex, that has parallels with the old traditions of mentors spitting into their mentee's mouth to, so they can carry on the magic. There's folk legends of Muhammad spitting into the mouth of some of his followers to bless them. They have, you know, it even it even has echoes of the old Egyptian practice of 
pouring water across a stele of Horus, gripping a scorpion, and then gathering it, having the children drink it, so that the water which touched the holy image blesses the child that drinks it, you know, that theory of contagion, that because it comes from a holy person, the Ajarn is magic, so that, you know, that that which comes of him contains him, you know, is is part of him and contains part of his blessing and his power to to do it. It's a, what a, what an incredible, you know, anecdote. And some monks actively leave their remains to be a benefit to the temple that they set up. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they leave instructions as to what should happen. Upstairs, mm. I, I recently found the bone of uh, Luang Puen, uh, which we will use in an amulet with a Jan Apichai at some point. And he just, they just gave away most of his remains to all his disciples because he wanted to help every single person that was his disciple. You know, and it's just different people have different ways of doing it. I mean, but I don't know whether us Westerners could cope with spreading ourselves out into the community. I don't know. I don't know. We also need to form uh, lineages properly. And, you know, there's also, there's a lot of work to be done, basically, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and as, as, as you touched on as well, Peter and, and Jack, it's coming back to this theme of community and of service. And as, as you just said, Peter, too, about, you know, whether it's Buddhism or Taoism or neither, that it's different ways of doing the same thing. It might be a different tradition, but it's the same thing. And I think, Peter, this leads to another listener question that we have for you uh, from Navdeep Bal. And Navdeep is asking and saying, Peter, are there any connections Thai magic has with India, since many things from the subcontinent, such as Sanskrit and Buddhism, have shaped Thai culture, you would assume there may be many components of the magic that are attributed to India. So any any thoughts on that, Peter? Um, Buddhism itself, Thai Buddhism came from Sri Lanka. It came up the country, at which point the language of Sri Lanka split into being Thaikom and Khmericom at, at its origin. Yeah? But that only happened about 1,500 years ago, something like that. But Buddhism's two and a half thousand years old. Yeah? So the Buddhism is particularly Sri Lankan in origin, although, of course, there is relationships to Indian Buddhism. Um, Buddhism brought the language, Kata, it brought the written language, and it brought Yantra. Yeah? But before that, we had the Rusi, the Lursi, the influence of Lursi. Now, when they came, there was already magic here. There was already a form of, we are convinced that there was a form of magic tattoos, because there is no history of magical tattoos in India. It's taboo. Where tiger magic was here, and some of the candle magic is older than Buddhism itself. And we know that from the structure of the spell and the language used. And ghost magic. There was a form of ghost magic here at that time as well, uh, and a way to construct ghosts and entities from the abilities of the Ajans. What we believe, and I had to ask Ajahn, I've talked to Ajahn Apichai about this. What we believe is that the Lursi brought the aversion of samati, focus, of how to attain a particular type of focus. Although there will have been magicians here at that time who were basically animist. Yeah? So they will have had their own version of a samati. And it was the samati, particularly, that was used for the gaining and direction of power. Samati with monks is used for the monk to let go of the earthly realm and rise. So we believe that the Lursi brought a form of Brahman magic that is still alive today in the court and in some of the more structured ritual magic to do with the court and the protection of the country from a Brahmin source. And also 
the way to pass on a way to pass on the power created within the body by samadhi. I hope that is detailed enough to answer Kundadeep's question. And a, a Lirsi would be sort of a hermit or a holy man, correct, who yes. travels Lucy, and shares his knowledge. Lirsi. Yeah. Yeah. That is Beard, hats, mm. corpsian, all Lirsi. Mm -hmm. That is excellent. It's, it's fascinating just to hear you share about this rich cross pollination and, and this rich, you know, holistic approach as well, uh, Peter. And uh, Peter, I definitely want to chat about some of the misconceptions with, you know, uh, that people might have, and you've already touched on them that Westerners might have about Thai esotericism and approaches. And then Jack, I, I know we have some uh, listener questions for you, but Peter, just to return to something that you touched on and that Jack touched on is there might be listeners wondering, well, you know, obviously they cannot become, if, if they're, you know, a Westerner, quote unquote, they can't become, you know, a direct uh, Thai sorcerer or a, a practitioner in that respect, but they can participate in this powerful occult system by caring for and communicating with the spirits contained in the ambulance by Thai sorcerers. So to that point, can you just elaborate on some um, very either important things to keep in mind or how to best care for these amulets or just any other advice that you have about if you are a Westerner being able to participate with respect and dignity and efficacy in this system? There's two ways to um, kind of interact with the tire system. One, as you say, is to become a Najan. There is only one Western man who has become a Najan for Sakyan, and he is a Jan Mat in Australia. And I knew he was a Najan as soon as I talked to him. He had been a monk, he could speak Thai fluently, and he studied with one of the great lineages, um, a Jan toy in Bangkok. Yeah? So it can be done, but to be honest, you know, a lot of people here are born with the demand to be in the jam. They might be in the jam returned. But sometimes that journey is really hard. It's thankless. You know, it's too tough. And I believe I've been offered to become a Luke sitter most of the Ajans, and I don't bother. I just want to kind of represent them and help the people in the outside world understand them. The other thing I am good at is easing the entry into the system. And uh, that is what, that's the only thing in this book that I have constructed through the help of the Ajans about how to enter in an easy way. Because when I started this, you know, I like ghosts. I've had ghosts in my life all my, you know, all my life. Um, so I just go out and buy the maddest shit I could find, you know. I'd have a finger around my neck one week and a lump of skull around my neck the next, you know. But all those times have gone. Uh, it's, now, um, we're, it's now heavily regulated. You can't do that sort of thing. And really, you know, it's not very attractive, is it? So we've spent time restructuring how we enter these things safely because there is a lot of misinformation about what can happen to you. Um, so we worked out that it came to light one day that Ajahn Apichai can tell people from their astrology whether they can use human materials, whether they can use putakum materials, which are supernatural materials that are not associated with pride, and what they are best at, what they can use or not use. And the initial step for what anybody should do is to understand themselves before they go any further. Some people, should, the odd example of people should have no magic in their life at all. Other people might have to boost a certain element to be able to cope with these things. And some other people may have to start off with an amulet to balance something in the birth chart. They might be lacking natural protection from their birth chart. 
All this can be seen through Thai astrology. I don't know whether it can be seen through anything else, any other form of astrology, because I don't study them. But the Thai astrology has adapted itself to be of use to the Ajahn, to magic itself. So like Ajahn will also check the astrology of his luxets, his apprentices, to understand whether they can learn their character, how they should learn, what they are lacking and what they are good at. He can know that before they even start. Yeah? So if we have that, it, and I constructed that, I managed to get the information out of them to be able to ease a way into this. And that is really what most people need. They just need to balance themselves, especially if studying another form of magic, to make them their best self to move forward in whatever direction they want to move forward in. I, I have to add on Peter, what Peter said too is, he's provided this wonderful line of approach to the system that begins with asking an Ajarn, look at my birth chart, let, help me decide what I should focus on, which is a huge gift because most people being faced with the overwhelming panoply of occult or arcane knowledge, there's a sense of wh where to begin, you know, and someone's like, should I be a mage or should I? like they, this is one way to get an expert traditional to say, why don't you focus on this and we'll give you something to help mitigate that. And it gives you, you know, it gives you context. It gives you a, a you know, a point of approach to, to do that. It's wonderful. But there's a corollary to that, which is, don't ask if you don't want to know. <laughs> Peter, we, we have had examples. Peter, Peter gives an example in his book of someone who said to Zarn, you know, dear Zarn, you know, look at my, here's my birth chart. Can I work with necromancy? The chart, the Zarn's like, you absolutely should not. And the person's like, who are you to tell me I can't work with necromancy? I've been doing it for five years. I can't believe you told me that. Why would you say that? You, you don't know me. You're not the boss of me. It's like, well, they, don't ask if you don't want to know. Like, it's it's like that person is not asking. They're ask, That person's just asking me affirmation of what their path they're already on. Like, you, you have to be sincere. If I, I must admit, that's that's quite rare, but it was a very funny example. <laughs> and after the third email, I said, look, mate, why did you ask? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's because, you know, he can also give people examples of how they learn and what they need to watch out for. Some mm. people can skip over information and that can be viewed through the astrology. So he might... He will often say, look, you have a tendency to jump information, study one piece at a time, only move on when you understand it fully. Yeah? And, you know, it's, and also you, you are going to need to study meditation. Your mind shoots off in tangents all the time. And, you know, this is fantastic. It's way easier than when I was entering the system. And it's exactly what, kind of, it's exactly what I thought we needed. We needed their help to enter into their system. That's nice. And just for any listeners, if someone wanted one of these astrological readings, could they contact you, Peter, like either by email or mess Facebook and say, can yeah. you hook me up with a legit Ajarn to help me like that? Yeah, we use Ajarn Apichai because he, uh, his teachers are really exceptional. I was lucky enough to sit around recently when they were discussing the coming of Rahu later this year. And uh, even from what, this, when this conversation went on for 45 minutes, you know, and I just sat and tried to understand as much as I could in what was going on and asked Ajahn about it later, you know. And so it, it comes from the right place. It comes from the correct place. Mm, that's cool. And just for anyone who doesn't know, could, can it, briefly, who is, what is Rahu within the tradition? Uh, Rahu is one of the elements of Thai astrology that's not in uh, the astrology of the West. We don't have Pluto, but we have Rahu. Rahu is the shadow. Rahu is the shadow that can be cast on life. Um, like, you know, they praise Rahu when we have an eclipse. Mm. Or they will go outside and bang pots to keep him away because he's mm. directly associated with luck. And we have a, a Rahu coming in October, and he's going to stick around for a while, causing all sorts of trouble. Um, and that's what we were. That's what was being discussed. 
Uh, he's tricky. Sometimes his effects are always mitigated by Jupiter, which is part of the case later this year. Uh, Jupiter is the main planet that we look out for, really, as far as the easiness of life, which is the same in Western astrology. There's just little idiosyncrasies and different ways of viewing <laughs> these things. You know? But I've, I've, I found that fascinating in your book that, you know, in Western tradition, the sort of seven major planetary powers, and that is that is mirrored in Thai culture, but they also have Rahu, so they have eight, and Rahu's seems to be sort of the joker in the deck that can reverse fortune or... He's the guy you don't want at your party. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we do, we have Neptune and Uranus as well, of course, you know. Um, but uh, the difficulty comes around uh, late December where we, on one side of the world, we have Rahu. And the diametric opposite side of the world, we have Mars. Hmm. So um, it could get a bit stickier around the end of December, something like that. But Jupiter is still with us. Jupiter is with us really until for another good year and a half. So it's workable. We may just need advice on how to make things work because there's always mitigation that we can undertake. Hmm. That is, that is so rejuvenating just to hear about the ways that, that you can mitigate work with, repel, attract, and, and given specific astrological conditions and, and, and really how to mitigate or, or I, engage I, with to them. To be honest, I think the biggest mitigation is not worrying about it. Mm. The biggest mitigation <laughs> is to build ourselves by using Qatar, by following whatever magic we practice to hone our instincts and trust yourself is the biggest mitigation, mitigation or remedial action for any astrology. So, Peter, something as, as Jack knows that I love to ask uh, guests are, can you name two or three misconceptions that people have about your subject. And I believe that you've already listed two, uh, well, many, but two strong ones, that, the very last two, which is the number one misconception is someone who goes in and says, I don't need to know about my birth chart. I don't need to know about my strengths or weaknesses. I'm fine. And then the second one, it seems is I need to worry so much about every single astrological and every <laughs> single thing. So those are those are two misconceptions that you've effectively snapped in half. Are there any other misconceptions before we get to your future projects and Taya Cult 3 and everything else? Are there any other misconceptions that you want to leave uh, listeners with that they also need to break? And the, one of them is the fact that it's scary. And trust me, I'm the most scary aspect of this art that you'll get. Yeah, it's the only thing scary about this is the truth and the reality of the in the cold light of day. Everything else has got Buddhist overlays. We when we use pride is with the permission of the ghosts, they benefit directly in the relationship. And it is a Buddhist concept of metta. It's a Buddhist concept of caring for the dead. Um, that is particularly the case when the pride comes from somebody young and everybody understands that it's a terrible place to be. Is the, the levels of hell are a terrible place to be and monks will go out of their way to care for young ghosts. You know? The second one is that it's black magic. All magic is grey. All magic is grey. The Buddha forbade magic. There's no in here. There's no such thing as white magic. The lot of it's wrong. Whatever level you're studying, and it just is. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to talk about it that much. We don't have to get involved in it that much. It's best not to think about it and just do it. Yeah. And the last great one is about magic and gambling. As a Jan Perm Rung said, if magic was any good for gambling, I would make one amulet and not have to deal with you lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love a Jan Perm Rung. He's just one of God's little rays of sunshine. You know. It it can't be emphasized enough what, what Peter just said. If you look at the pictures alone in Thai magic, a Westerner would who's not expecting it would be you know have their breath taken away to see these you know to see you know in a, in a typical stall 
corpses on the wall covered in gold leaf to see you know, the skeletons of monks being shaved away so that pieces of it can be given to raise the ghost of the, of the, it, the necromantic aspects are frightening the average to the West, you know, the ideas of boiling a corpse to get an oil, to create luck, to, con- you know, to connect, to uh, make a love connection. It cannot, it's mind blowingly shocking to the West. And yet from their point of view, one of the biggest gifts in Peter's books, is giving us a window into their mindset. In the West, to do something like that would be to damn yourself and you spend eternity in hell. So it's a very binary religion we have, and it's very binary thinking. In mm-hmm. Thailand, as he explained, of course, being a Buddhist culture, they believe in karma, they believe in reincarnation. If a client comes to them and say, I want, I've fallen in love with this person, I want them to love me, not that person, And the Thai magician agrees to raise a ghost to make this happen. If it happens, then the bereaved partner is working off their karma, that they had stored up bad karma from a past life. The lucky client, if it works, is receiving the reward from good karma they've stored up in a past life. The spirit that's used to be the agent of this thing is is helping the person with good karma and the person with bad karma, even the scale of their karmic scales, so that spirit gains karma too. And if it works, the Thai sorcerer or the client may offer meta, may offer offerings to bless the dead, to, to give food to monks, to donate money to a temple, thereby gaining, gaining good karma and, and, and enacting the good karma owed by the, the monks and the poor and the temple that get blessed. In their worldview, it's all working out the way it's supposed to work out. And they're a Mm -hmm. cog in that machine helping effectuate this incredible, beautiful, complex thing. They're not doing something bad. They're doing what's necessary. They're part of this river, this current of karma, which is the expression of their whole reality. So there's not the posturing you get in the West if you're going to do necromancy. There's not, you know, there's there's not the same attitude that I I court damnation in order to commit this curse. Like they would laugh at that. It's it seems childish from their point of view. They're, you know, I'm not the first person to say it. Their worldview is much more mature and nuanced than most of ours in the West. And it's and you see that in their magic. And that's that's part of what's remarkable about it. We recently, I recently talked to Ajahn Apichai about collecting oil from corpses. And I said to him, I said, have you ever done the traditional method? He said, oh, yeah. I said, when was that? He said, when I was 12. <laughs> he You're was talking about young boiling, co- boiling corpses down. It's like, like, well, no, the, like siphoning the off, the, ju- siphoning off is, the bodily fluids of a corpse, probably in a cemetery at midnight, right? You know. <laughs> well, what it was, was he knew the, he was interested in magic. Adan is a returned magician, without a doubt. Yeah? Yeah. And as a nen, a young monk at 12, he asked him a, a, an undertaker he knew about whether he could tap Naman Pry. Yeah? So he said he went in and <laughs> he said he was terrified. He was in a graveyard at midnight. You know, he shouldn't have been there. He was with one guy and a corpse. And he'd seen it. It's on television, things like that here. It's part of soap operas. And he expected the corpse to sit up itself so he could tap the fat under the chin or under the breast. It's usually one of those two places. So he's a bit shocked when he's having to help the undertaker lift the corpse up because the ghost had told him it wanted, it would give oil and fat from under its chin. Yeah. So you have to burn candles there. And he didn't expect it to be such a high school. It was so heavy. I was only 12. <laughs> and so he tapped it and he had uh, five candles burning under the, cut the flesh, burnt the oil off, collected it, and it was about, about that much. Yeah. And then took it home and uh, refined it very slightly. So it filled three very thin files about this much. And he never did anything with it because... He didn't know what to do with it. He just stored it under his altar. And then recently he finally used one of them, which is why this story came out. You know, it took him, what, 25 years 
to actually use it because he wanted to do it for the experience of the magic rather than for any specific purpose. And it's the only time he has ever managed to do it. Imagine a 12 year old doing it. I think, I know, we'd end up being mentally ill. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. That's absolutely incredible. And, and again, it's, it's coming back to that, the, the tributaries, the stepping into living history, uh, stepping into an initiatory tradition, stepping into um, that sense of community. It is, it is so amazing. Listeners, please check out the podcast and video descriptions um, for to a link to check out and get your own copy of Taya Cult 2 before it's gone. I mean, truly. Uh, make sure to do that. And Jack, before we get to your uh, questions uh, as well, we have a few listener questions for you. Peter, I mean, this has been amazing. Just like the uh, Thai esoteric tradition, I feel like this conversation is just the surface. And I, I truly uh, <laughs> hope that that we, it would be an honor just to chat with you again. But just as we um, wrap up the main part of the podcast here, can you share with us, you, you touched on, you intimated about Taya Cult 3 and, and other things. What are the plans for your future projects, future research, and also just what are you thinking about right now? What are you engaging in conceptually and then in future research? I think there's still understanding to be had, mm. to be honest. And the Taya Cult 1 started as the story and the legends, which we have to know. It's more cultural than anything else. The Taya Cult 2 is the depth of the magic around the country. The Taya Cult 3 has to be the magic, creation of magic itself. And what they use, but not they, what Wanajan uses. So we have to, and the weird thing is already, is that the size of the universe of the magic within Wanajan feels conceptually similar to the size of the universe of magic in the Tire Cult 1 and Tire Cult 2. Yeah, so it's again, it's like when interviewing a dancer about Lana magic, looking at something from a different direction. This is a highly focused pinpoint direction. It's going to take time because, again, as usual, we're coming up with constantly new forms of magic, new ways of creating magic, new uses for magic. Uh, I want and The reason I didn't do the metals is that I'm working with Ajahn Apichai about a description of the metals. The reason I will not do the herbs, I've already explained, but we will talk with Ajahn Apichai about the herbs he uses and why, and why he chose them, what is the affinity between him and them, things of that nature. And then the products he uses, the products he likes to use, which again is different for every single Ajahn. We will. After that, I want to do... I have a long-term project that may never get printed, but I want to do a five-year book about a diary of the Tire Cult because um, astrology is going to get a bit strange, and I think I need to look at how the magicians adapt themselves to the coming future. That certainly sounds like an epic um exploration and <laughs> well, the diary ain't gonna get printed i can tell you that now it starts yeah. off and roasting babies <laughs> never say never <laughs> <laughs> but the story of that roasted baby is one of the most beautiful stories you could ever read about such a tragic event mm -hmm. it's just beauty it's stunning that was one of the corpses that was looked after by two of the greatest monks of this region. And when Kruba Inta died, he passed on the responsibility of raising that spirit out of hell to Kruba Poinsett, who was one of the uh, Kruba Ajans of Ajan and Dink. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's even in tragic events, sad events, just, just hearing about the engagement, the responses, the, you know, um, 
power that I think surrounds that is is incredibly. I I can't even I truly cannot even begin to imagine. But Peter, hearing you share that, I, I know that myself, no matter what's published or with future research, and obviously with Taya Cult Three, um, I know that uh, we will be having our ears to the ground on on all of your research and and, and really. I think approaching your work from the first time when Jack slid Taya Cult One slowly across the table to me when I first was introduced to you, um, getting that beautiful, rare window into this incredibly rich and deep in space and time tributary of esotericism uh, with uh, the Taya Cult. Uh, it is it is so amazing. Um are there are there any Peter any 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 uh, parting words or any any last bits of information or or something maybe we we haven't touched on that you'd like to share with listeners about the Taya Call? Of course, we'll make sure to link below to uh, all of the uh, ways that you can get your own copy of Taya Cult too. But anything else that we haven't touched on yet, Peter, that you'd like to share? I think that covers most bases. It's been a pleasure. It's nice to come out of my cave, my dark cave, <laughs> um, into the open world. You know, it's um, because you know I'm I'm lucky enough to be able to live within this myself. You know, I've got to go and see Ajahn Dewey today and uh, talk about some plans that we're doing and paying for some candle magic that we've just done, and then seeing Ajahn Apichai on Monday again and Ajahn things and the white crew on Sunday, you know, it's, it's very, so easy to get lost. So emerging and coming out in this way is a real pleasure. And, uh, and uh, especially also with having Jack here as well, to be able to get ideas through that's filtered through his experience is essential in this as well. You know, well, you, you, as, as, Jack mentioned about a, a fish being able to describe water. You're constantly swimming in this water, Peter, but thankfully with Taya Cult 1 and 2 and, and Future 3, you're able to describe the water to us who, who really <laughs> un, are able to understand the, the, the currents that you're... It's you're wet. <laughs> <laughs> the shortest book in history. <laughs> Jack, do you think we can get that book published? That specific book? <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't put anything past us. Uh, well, uh, well, well, Peter, and, and feel feel free to um, jump into these questions for Jack as well. But of course, uh, Jack, you know, Peter had a bunch of uh, great questions from from listeners and from supporters, and we do have a few for you as well. So I believe we have uh, three questions for you. So. Uh, the first one, Jack, is from uh, the listener and podcast supporter, and their name is Gloria and Excelsis Deo, which I love that that name that they're using, which is great. <laughs> um, and they're asking and saying, hi, Peter and Jack. Congratulations on your new endeavor. May the odds be ever in your favor. This question is for Jack. What a pleasure it is to see you on the show again I have the Hecation, your book, Jack, on pre-order. I'm in your PGM Praxis cohort number seven, which is amazing. I'm considering signing up for the next Hail Hecate course when it opens next. When is that, by the way? As well as God Song. And they're asking and saying, Jack, I would like to do all of your courses and I'd like to do them all now. That said, I have a habit of making ambitious, but completely unrealistic study plans, which all end up with me, you know, uh, falling uh, on my non-magical face. I appreciate your advice on the best way to approach studying and working with your material and teachings. I'm also a very linear learner, if that helps, and I'm looking to install a magical system and practice in my life. I am already a student of Quaria, which is Josephine McCarthy's system. Uh, and thank you. And so any advice, Jack, that you have? Oh, what a what a what a warm comment! That sounds like a, I really appreciate them saying that. There's what I teach. If anyone doesn't know, like I teach online some courses. There's one on the the traditional magic of Hecate that can be found in like the Chaldean oracles or the Greco Egyptian magical papyri, or uh, the you know Orphic hymns and that sort of thing. That class is called Hail Hecate. It's offered through the Blackthorn School, and I offer another class that's a year long class that covers 
a curated set of spells from the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri, the PGM, which are spells that come out of Egypt in late antiquity, where we cover a spell or two a week for a year. And I also teach a class called God Song, which is looking at the arcane or occultic aspects of the Iliad and Odyssey, and sort of identifying in those very old narratives, when does magic, when does fate, when does destiny, when does devotion, you know, when, when, when are they expressed in those works and what can we learn from it? You know, when does it mirror what we already know? And when does it surprise us with its interesting uh, paradigm? And that's a year long class as well. I, uh, it consists of a, a year's worth of recordings by myself and T. Susan Chang, who's a, an author of many popular tarot books on tarot, and she can uh, read and speak ancient Greek. And I have the great privilege of creating that course with her where we um, we went through both the Iliad and the Odyssey over the course of a year. So if the person's already taking, you know, the PGM course, that class lasts a year. So, you know, if they're very linear, then perhaps it would be best to wait until that one's finished and then delve into the others if they're still interested. I know that a lot of the people that take my courses, what's amazing is not only they Almost all of them are so passionate about the material, but they also have lives outside this. You know, they have jobs, they have families, they have kids. So there's single mothers in this group. There's people juggling two jobs. There's people taking care of their parents, people trying to heal from injuries and accidents and all this stuff. So I think there can, uh, the enthusiasm always has to be tempered with a sense of, of you know, of, of, of sort of taking things modestly and, and letting things play out and not perhaps over committing in a way, because sometimes it's amazing. I'll get an email from someone in one of my courses apologizing that they haven't had time to look at the videos in two months. And I, I always say, like, what are you apologizing for me for? You paid for the content. It's there for you. You can, like, there's no require. This isn't a class, like, with homework and assignments and things. I present content, and you watch it when you want. And if you want to talk or engage, you do. And And if you don't, you don't, you know. But it surprises me. I think, oh my God, this person's been feeling bad for weeks, as if I'm scanning. You know, <laughs> how many people have watched it? I'm like, oh, he hasn't looked at it yet. So I posted it three days ago. What the heck's the problem? You know, I don't do that. I don't have time to do that. I don't care. Um, so I, I think it's. I really am flattered that they're excited about the other courses, and I'm really pleased they chose to order my book, which should be out by hopefully by summer's end. Um, but uh, but I would urge them. You know. Take the long view. Don't stress your, you know, your your attention span. You know, allows there to be some room to do other things. Life can't be all, you know, occultism and whatever. I'd say just take it one thing at a time and uh, and take it easy. Well, and for the podcast, yourself and Peter and I were discussing uh, Hecate as well briefly, and we do have a another question for you from Michelle Rella Summers, who is asking. I've been and saying I've been called to work with Hikate since my early 20s. Now in my 50s, I'm still called to work with her. However, there have sometimes been long periods of time when I was unable to feel her presence. I'm not sure what to make of that, but I've heard the same thing amongst a few other Hikate devotees. What are your thoughts? You know, I think um I think there's two things I'd like to respond to there. One is that I think internal, what Peter, it connects me back to what Peter said, trust your instincts, trust your intuition, trust yourself. It's the best gift you can give a, a burgeoning artist, and it's the best gift you can give a burgeoning magician or priest or sorcerer <laughs> or monk, is to let them trust and listen to that inner voice, right? <laughs> if this person feels called to do devotional or magic work with a deity or a spirit, they should gift themselves with the opportunity to do just that. I saw an irritating post on Facebook where someone said, I, I feel called to, you know, honor Hakate, but I've heard that you can only do that if she calls you first. And someone said, that's right. And and I was like, how are you talking about? Like, what are you waiting for a phone to phone to ring? You know, like if you're called, it's when you, in your heart, you want to do it. You feel drawn. You might feel scared a bit. You might feel, con you know, con you know, confused by the attraction. You might feel uncertain how to proceed, but that's the beginning of a beautiful journey, you know, to study or to 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 reach out, to try things, and maybe some don't work and some do. So you lean into the ones that do, or you try new things, or you get together with a friend, or you take a class, or you read a book, or you just develop your own workings. You know, it, I think the best gift we can give ourselves is the opportunity 
to follow through on those impulses and make discoveries we wouldn't normally make. So I hope she does, you know, I really hope she does. That phrase really moves me, you know, that there have been periods of time where she felt there was nothing there. And I think if we're honest, many of us can feel that at times. Um, I heard it even when, you know, when Peter said he carried around prize sometimes, you know, pry is, is magical remains, you know, of a person, animal or plant. And, and you might carry it around and not feel anything. We thought there would be ghostly apparitions or voices in your head. And we may just sometimes feel deaf to the spirit world, those of us, you know, who weren't born to it and uh, who weren't, or who aren't gifted with preternatural, you know, instincts and, and apprehensions. And I think all I can say is this, you know, P Peter said it best when he said, we basically said, we're conduits of magic. We're conduits. You know, the magic flows through us if you allow it to. So a lot, I think, of the praxis is sort of clearing out the conduit to allow that force to flow through. You don't have a choice of whether it's flowing through you. That comes from without. The most you can do is become available to it. Whether it comes, it's like artistic inspiration. The best you can do is make time for it and allow it to. But but there's a sense when we become discouraged, you may drop a praxis. Say, well, I've done three workings. I didn't really feel like anything was present. I didn't get the shivers. I didn't see anything. There were no weird dreams. I I think I you know I feel like this deity is not for me. But I think we tend to give up too soon. I think we tend to expect results right away. I think most of us, our attention span is very short. <clears throat> I think one thing we get when we read these books of Taya Kultism is you look at, holy hell, these people are invested. These people are invested. They do not expect immediate results. They do not expect immediate returns. And you see that in traditional workings too. When you read a book on jinn magic, recite this spell, recite this phrase 4,000 times, most Westerners be like, what the fuck? How many? Like, most people, I, I'm like, I did the spell three times. I'm really proud of myself. 4,000 recitals, but because these dudes are in it to win it, right? So I think part of it can be, A, you know, reducing our expectations. We're not always going to feel like there's, you know, something glowing, hovering above our shoulder, but to keep at it. And to keep at it in a way where you allow yourself the freedom to add on to what you're doing and try things new, layer it, you know, it's a challenge to stay interested. It's like trying to stay interested in a, you know, in a in your job or a, or a partner or a friend after you've known them for decades. It's a challenge not to let it get stale and to plateau. It's a challenge to find new things to do so you don't just become, you know, you know, you're un, un, unambitious with the relationship. And so, especially if you have limited money, limited time, you know, other concerns, people relying on you. You only have 15 minutes between putting the kids to bed and when you're expected to, you crash because you're too tired to do anything. That's, that's part of the challenge of this journey, how to discover and try things. A lot of it can help by trying to find someone to practice with. So much in the West, our praxis is solo. And it often has to be that way. Person, you know, a lot of people don't. It's unusual to find people interested in magical systems, neo-paganism, arcane, esoteric stuff. But even if it were by Zoom, even if it were the phone, if you could make a friend, it makes all the difference in the world to have someone to do it with. There's a reason why uh, Jesus in the gospel says, wherever two of you are more together, I'm there. It's surprising. You know, you would think when I was a kid, I heard that thing. You'd, you'd think you'd just say, "Wherever whoever says my name, I'm present to them. That would make sense. But he says, wherever two or more are there, I'm there. And I think what it means is we are epiphanies of the gods to each other. You know, it's not just dreams. It's not just visions. It's not just a barking dog or a gust of wind or the, the eclipse. These are all epiphanies. But we're epiphanies too. They're epiphanies in the phenomenal world, and we're part of the phenomenal world. So when we connect with someone, even if they're not our ideal cho choice, and say, hey, I want to do a working. I know it's not totally your thing, but will you come? Will you come? Can we do this together? What would you like to do? When we start to form that bridge, then there becomes a relational aspect to the magic and things may start to happen that keep it fresh, you know? And so I'd, 
I would urge, you know, though it's hard, I would urge people to look for ways to make connections as opposed to just focus on what separates us. I remember, you remember Witchbox, the old uh, the old website where people would post, you know, their, their, it was sort of like, a, for those who don't know, it was a website where people would post, say like, I'm a practicing, you know, Wiccan and I'd love to, I'd love to meet people in my area and here's what I'm into. And it was like a very early you know, website for that. Well, I never forget, I'm in central Illinois and I was looking at it and there weren't many posts on it back in the day, but there's a very small town near me, probably has 10,000 people. And one of them said there were two people and two separate ones on which Fox listed Garnerian Wicca. I was like, oh, how oh, nice. And two people found each other in this really small town. And one of them said, you know, Garnerian witch school, come one, come all, you know, this is the, uh, you know, the, the best witch school in the state. And the other persons, I thought, well, that's cool. They formed a witch school. And I look at the other ones and it said, pay no attention to so-and-so's school. My witch school <laughs> is the only one in the state. The true, the true Garnerian current flows only through my witch school. Like, there's only two of them in central Illinois, both <laughs> in the same town. And they're competing each other and shit-talking each other. <laughs> like, instead of... Focusing on the gift, they actually found someone in the exact same spiritual path. <laughs> Instead, they're total rivals. <laughs> like, and that's exactly, that's exactly <laughs> why the Tire Jams work together and like each other. <laughs> right? That's the West. <laughs> that's the West. <laughs> May I say one thing, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one thing that helped me, because uh, I had May Burr screaming down my ear at about, you know, um, you know, 100 decibels, which was a bit of a shock. Um, I think it helps if we open ourselves to the age of the practice itself. If we realise that, like in Buddhism, they open them, people open themselves to two and a half thousand years of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. and invite that age within. Mm -hmm. And it can really, really lift the spirit and help with the radio tuning. Yeah? Thank you, Bob. Want to say hello, Bob? No, doesn't, Bob doesn't want to say hello. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it can help with the tuning. And I think I found it extremely useful to do that. And the other thing is, is uh, I presume Hecate is the deity now. Is that correct, Jack, or not? But what? Say again. Hecate is a deity? Yeah, yeah. Deities are busy. You know, they've got lots of people to care for. They, they probably have a job as well, actually, Jack, you know. Yeah. Um, and you can't, you know, like here, we, when people who pray to the Buddha are not, and they make requests to the Buddha. You know, he's a he's he's a pretty busy chap. It's going to be more <laughs> difficult than praying to a ghost who don't have who want and need the merit from helping somebody. Mm. Yeah? So you know, we can't really expect ourselves to have direct contact with her. We can't really expect her to talk to us directly. When to being talked to directly, you don't often know what it actually is. So I think just the acceptance of the age and the beauty of the practice of her will really help people past that point. And those that are open will have a, gain a particular shine that comes with that attitude. It's a fantastic suggestion and the idea it's of Buddhist. focusing on it's Buddhist. I've just I've just stolen it. <laughs> no, but it's it's a wonderful one. And why not instead of asking Hakate to enter our life and reveal herself to us, why not ask her, help me access this an ancestor who can help me. Help me open the gateway between me and the spirit of my cemetery that I'd like to communicate with. Can you Hakate help me communicate with the spirit of the land I live on so that I can yeah become more rooted in the land and basically use open. her as a facilitator. Oh. Yeah. Open it up. Use her as a facilitator to reach out to other things that you might be able to connect with. I love that. I think that's great. And I'll also add a game changer could be becoming initiated in a system. And um, 
you know, my book is meant to be a, a self-initiation in the, the mysteries of Hecate, but that's just one person's take on it. There's lots mm-hmm. of covens that offer initiations. There's lots of different uh, groups that do initiations, whether it's Hecatean or not. Um, I've, I've done the, you know, uh, it an initiation is a way to open oneself up to a deity to say, I'm allowing myself to be sort of a platform for you. I will be an mm-hmm. epiphany of you. So why don't you use me like a glove and mm-hmm. I can be one of your, you know, I, you can affect the living world through me. And it's it's worth remembering the people in, in um, Athens participated in the Eleusian mysteries every year. So they were Athenians. They had done it as children, but it wasn't just like a Christian getting baptized once in a few days after they were born. They went every year, as many of them as could. Why did they do that? They were already initiated. They did it to continually revivify this spirituality. And one of the reasons why Eastern Eastern mystery traditions um, were very popular in Rome, but not very popular in Greece, is because the Greece had such an identity, and they Mm -hmm. participated annually in the Eleusian mysteries, many of them. So they were, they were, they were, um, you know, soaked in their world. They did it regularly. It was them. They weren't sort of tempted to go outwards because they were constantly reinitiating. And I think there's a great model there. And most of us don't have that opportunity. Eleusis was a a remarkable institution. But there's nothing wrong with saying if there was a group two hours away that offered a weekend initiation into the mysteries of the goddess, most people I know be like, well, what tradition is it? Mm, I'm not. I'm not that. Why not go? Why not ask? What would it take? Can I participate? Who cares if they're not your exact path? Who cares if they're not? You'll never find someone that agrees with you on all terms. And if you do, you'll, there'll be a rival. <laughs> right? But like, why not take it to the next level with the help of other people if it feels safe and if, if the system has some integrity there? You know. And it just sounds like a white crew, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Right. It just—that's what it is. This is this is the yearly things that should be done, you know, mm-hmm. where we can receive a blessing and not, you know, to you know, forgive us for anything we've done wrong, and you know, it's just a reaffirmation of the whole structure and the beauty of it all. And there must be a million ways to do that in some form. Yeah, that's well put. And a white crew. What 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 Peter just said. A white crew is like a special day to honor and ajourn so that you can receive their blessings and they receive their due, which is to be honored by the people who they mentored or who they influenced. And they, it renews the energies, it renews the connection, it renews yeah. the connection to the community, yeah. everything. And yeah. you always come out feeling completely refreshed. Yeah. And it, it's, it's worth mentioning, it seems obvious, it's getting harder and harder to connect on a personal level to people, at least certainly here in the West, especially after the pandemic. It was getting harder to begin with as all these institutions that require participation, less and less participation, more people sitting at home just eating edibles and watching Netflix. It's easier. It's scary to interact with people. It's awkward. You it's part to- of the uh, astrology for this decade. That's as well. well. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. But all the more reason to push back because as institutions shrink and as organizations collapse and as you know community theaters close and, and symphonies go out of business and as fewer people going to Masonic temples and not enough people willing to go to open rituals. I talked to friends who were in covens in the 70s, and this was in the Atlanta area, not in San Francisco or something. And they said 300 people would show up. And I was like, how many? Like 300. And not on just on a Sabbath. The 300, because in the 70s in the West, it was where it was at, you know, magic and goddess witchcraft. It had the, it had this edge, you know, if you weren't orthodox and, you know, you wanted to be part of the counterculture, that draw, you wanted to meet other people in it. You couldn't go online. You, there was nothing good on TV. You wanted to meet people like you. You wanted a best friend. You wanted a girlfriend. You wanted an initiation. You wanted to be part of the inner coven. You want to be, start your own. You, you sh- 300 people? Yep. Nowadays, I guarantee if that group tried to host an event, they might get 13, 17. You know, and they'd all argue. Right, right. You know, so it's, 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 it's a 
great. It's like what Peter said. I love when you say magic can save the world, but to do it, like the initial step is get in touch with other people. <laughs> like, you can't well, I think that actually people. comes, I think it comes second. I mm. think that. Mm. I think um, the shocks that are coming Hmm. will draw us back together. Because, you know, when I was a kid, nobody gave a shit about somebody else's politics. You know, I've been absolutely horrified at the nutties I know as I've gone through life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. doesn't matter, man. They are beautiful people. They're my right. mates. Right. There's such an emphasis. We joke about in esotericism in the West, you know, you versus me, and I know more than you, your system sucks. But of course, it applies politically. Of course, it applies yeah. culturally. Of course, it applies class-wise. Of course, it applies to every category you can think of. It's like every system we can imagine is trying to encourage us to divide each other and think of the other as less and to and to cling to ideas more than people. And yeah. we have to work beyond that. You don't have to be completely identical to someone else to share a meal with them, to share a laugh to do a ritual together, you know, you if you if you believe you are, you've been fooled and you're going to be very lonely your whole life. You know, one of the projects we're undertaking uh, here, me and, me and Bob, is that we want to build a home. Uh, of course, we've bought some land across the road and it's a lovely, quiet little soil, lovely, quiet little street. And we're just going to build a home for family and friends for like when Bangkok is underwater. Mm. And that ain't far off. Like a haven. Yeah? It's, it's already on sea level. Yeah. Wow. And it's sinking because of the weight of the buildings. Oh. And it's just to bring some sort of shielding, because with that community comes the umbrella, comes the shield, comes the strength of individuals, comes the fact that we can all contribute to these things instead of getting wrapped up in what we're being forced to be wrapped up with, which is not necessarily to our advantage. Mm. So I still believe that magic will cure us, but we're going to have to go through some form of mental breakdown first mm. on a worldwide basis. And I think that mental breakdown will come this decade. I hope I'm wrong, you know, but I think most people out there are feeling have an instinct that things are about to change severely. And this decade is about change. So, you know, as a mitigation for that, introduce change yourself. Introduce change into everything you do. And it will free you up from the pressures that's been placed on the people. And we might come through this better than we entered it. We ne you never know. That's, again, I, I hope, I know you listeners, and I, I try not to speak on your behalf, uh, but I, I know that you'll appreciate that as much as I do because it ties into the theme that, Peter, you've touched on in this discussion and in the book and Jack as well, this theme of community, of you know being proactive and coming together and sharing and doing things in devotion and service to others, which is so lovely. And I think this this very last listener question uh, for you, Jack and Peter. I, I'd love your thoughts if if there's any advice with the Thai esoteric tradition that you have, and, and I think you both have touched on this because I believe that this last question talks about someone who's seeking to become a devotee of a deity, at, but they don't feel that they're being called by the deity. And so this last question is from. Again, Gloria and Excelsis Deo, I love the name, and they're asking and saying, is it possible to speak to the concept of deities or Hecate in this case, for example, reaching out and calling a devotee, please? I've never been called. I've not seen the goddess Hecate in dreams. I've never gotten any sign that I can think of, but I really like the concept of the goddess Hecate, and I keep returning to her again and again, yet I find myself wondering about the chosen devotee trope a lot. Thank you very much. So any any advice or any observations about, about that, uh, Jack and, and Peter, about be, becoming a chosen devotee or hearing or not hearing a response, anything at all? I think, I think 
every one of us all day long sees epiphanies of the gods, and this the world of spirits is constantly manifesting itself to us in ways we often don't recognize until we allow ourselves to sort of waken to it, become more sensitive to it. And even then we just get it in glimpses, most of us, you know. This woman's interest in the spirit means that there's a connection there already. She encounters Hecate all the time. Hecate is it seems to be an epiphany of, of liminality. You know, there's a, a geographical liminality when you pass from one room to another. There's a temporal liminality when you go from this hour to the next hour, this year to the next year. There's a spiritual liminality when you go from states of ignorance to knowledge or innocence to experience or life and death. For this woman to be born at all, she had to pass through the threshold of a, of a woman's body, and that's a liminal threshold. This Hecate is interwoven into this woman's life, whether she knows it or not, and her desire to honor that and experience that more deeply is a, is a credit to her and a reflection that there's a part of her that yearns to more deeply know that liminal power. And I think that anything that stands between her and that journey is a uh, is, is worthless. It needs to be ignored. And I think the best way that she can lean into that, you know, is to understand the gods, when they do appear to us, when, you know, we seek to, they appear to everyone differently using the forms that we can recognize based on our own culture and our own life experience. Just like in dreams, you and I both might have a dream about snakes, but one of them it might be terrifying and the other one, it might be really heartwarming or exciting. And everyone's like that with everything. So part of be enter, you know, part of experiencing the gods is becoming familiar with your own mythology, with your own life, what you love and what you don't, how you see things and what you don't. And to be able to understand you can encounter a god in a pop song. You can encounter a god in a celebrity in your dreams. You can encounter a deity through the mask of someone you know, someone real that you're dealing with. In Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, most of the time the gods appear to Achilles or Odysseus or Patroclus, they appear to them through each other. So in the field, things will be going south for Hector, and one of his you know, generals will say, if you retreat now, you won't get attacked, and you can make it back to the castle in the time. And Hector will say, that was the goddess Athena just talking to me, because that's the only plan that's going to get out of here. So everyone go. Athena wants us to leave. Well, why didn't the bard write to just glowing Athena appeared and advised him to leave? Instead, he said Athena appeared to him in the form of an advisor and gave him wise advice. They knew in 800 BC that the gods are interacting with us to help us fulfill our fate as vibrantly as possible. But they appear to us through epiphanies most of the time of the phenomenal world. It's like that phrase by Yeats, which I love, which is, there is another world, but it is in this one. So the biggest gift we can give ourselves on our spiritual journey is to open up our apprehension to what might be encountering the divine, encountering Hecate, encountering her servants or the spirits that are of liminality and all that. And one of the best ways to do it is, to, for instance, create a journal. You say a prayer, a simple devotional, right? Write what happened. You say, not much happened. I thought the shadows seemed a little brighter in the room. They seemed to get smaller, and an ambulance drove by. That's what happened. You write it down. You would forget it if you didn't. Then the next night, you do it again, and you say, once again, the room seemed a bit brighter by the end of the spell. I felt sort of a, a tingling on my left wrist, and I heard, I thought, something either a gunshot or a backfire at some point. And gradually, as you do this, and you review what you wrote, you start to recognize a vocabulary of epiphanies. And they can be internal and physical. You're like, I keep feeling this tingling in my left wrist. Well, guess what? There's no book of magic. They'll say, you'll feel tingling in your left wrist. But when Peter says, trust your instincts, that's part of what it is. You start to on an individual level know, when I get this tingling, something's happening. Or you recognize, when I pray to this deity, the room seems slightly brighter. This other one, feels very shadowy. I feel like someone's standing behind me. It's a difference, but it's subtle. You notice it over time. Well, you look at it and you're like, there's always something loud that happens in this one part of the prayer. There was an ambulance the one day. It was like a, a, a backfire the next. 
My dog started barking the third time I did it. There's always something punctuating the ritual. And very slowly you start to expect it. And you sometimes it's not there, but often it is. And all of a sudden you start to think, holy hell, there's something happening here. But it's happening on its own terms. And much of it is happening through the phenomenon of my space. If you go in the woods, it'll be different. But there will be parallels. Might be an owl hoot. There might be something that drifts down upon you. The tingling feeling might be on both wrists. You develop your apprehension of the unseen by listening to it internally, you know, as, as well as literally. But it helps to record it. Otherwise, it's lost. It's, you know, it doesn't seem important enough in the moment. It's only upon reflection that you start to see the pattern emerge. If you're like me, where the effects are subtle and you're not a mystic and you're not having these full-blown visions or experiences. So that's my suggestion. I'd be curious what Peter has to say, but that I would urge her, go ahead, go forward with it, but be open-minded, keep a journal and listen to your own bodily and the phenomenal responses you get when you do the work. The only thing I can add to that is something that Dan Tay once said about uh, the gaining of uh, samadhi, the gaining of focus and how we use it in the world. And he said that every single form of religion or practice has their own version of samadhi. Mm -hmm. And you just described, for me, you just described a version of samadhi for Hecate. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. That's great. That's great it's, to hear. It, it's the same. And you're in that, you're allowing your instinct to come forward. Just got to keep the mind quiet enough, which, that's you know, can be done through breathing properly through the katana and through the spell and things like that. And that's, no, that's nothing to add. That's fantastic. And what samadhi is like that state of focus, right? That it's, spiritual it's a, focus. Pinpoint focus, and Ajahn Nanting described it the best, where he said it is soft. Mm. It's not. You know, <laughs> yeah, because I can see people trying to focus now, but the focus it kills me. It is no thinking, only focus. And what you described to me, for me, the way you described that, was a building of samadhi. Mm. Mm. It's just another way. There's millions of ways to do it. And it all is all beneficial. That reminds me of the uh, couple of lines from the poem, The Last Invocation by Walt Whitman, when he says, with the key of softness, unlock the locks, with the whisper, set open the doors, O soul. And I think about oh, what man. I think about what, what what you've mentioned, Jack, lovely Peter, your encouragement, your own adjurations to keep the door open, to let the get out of your own way, let the tributaries flow and return to that sense of community. It is I must so say, lovely. the only quote I've got in the book is the only thing that gets in the way of magic is ourselves. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, that's and awesome. by, by that description, you are not putting yourself in the way of magic. You are just being aware and listening. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. That's great. And it, it, it works. It works. We practice, you know. That's it awesome. Works. I... Much like the Thai esoteric tradition, this is an inexhaustible well, and, and I am certainly looking forward <laughs> very much to the next conversation. Peter Jenks, the, his latest tome is Thai Occult 2, and please check out the video, the podcast descriptions below. An author, researcher, someone who is giving us this unique view into this amazing tributary of Thai esotericism. And Jack Grail, author scholar, researcher, practitioner, and fan uh, <laughs> both at, at fangirl as well as I join being uh, as well a fan of, of <laughs> Peter Jenks as well. Uh, Peter and Jack, thank you both just so, so much for taking the time and for stopping by the podcast today. It is a true, sincere honor. Thank you both so much. Oh, very kind of you. Thank you thank very you. much. It's so wonderful to be here, Alex. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.